Almighty God, we humbly need to favor upon this Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Grant that it may perform its high duty as in thy sight. Give divine guidance to the President of the Republic and thou members of Parliament and ministers of state with discernment, ambition, integrity, and courage that through the labors of government, this land and people may be well and truly served, and that good purposes for the common human life be realized in our midst. Amen. O oh God, grant us a vision of our country, fair as it might be, a country of righteousness, where none shall wrong his neighbor, a country of where evil and poverty shall be done away with, a country of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service and honor shall be given to the deserving, a country of peace, where government shall rest on the will of the people and the love for the common good. Bless the efforts of those who struggle to make this vision a living reality. Inspire and strengthen our people that they may give time, thoughts, and sacrifice to speed the day of the coming beauty of Ghana and Africa. Amen. Honourable members, we'll go straight to item three, correction of votes and proceedings and official report. We will start with the votes and proceedings. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page Page six. Page seven. Yes, honorable. Who's going to write on our speaker? Write on our speaker your ruling on page eight. There are a few corrections to be made. The second paragraph on page eight, the fourth line, it should be off instead of on the the urgency of the matter. So it should be off. And the last but five line, Mr. Speaker, rendering it as being incompetent, having regard, having regard, not regarding, having regard to the impact on the livelihoods of Ghanaians occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic. And Speaker, the last word of that 
paragraph, paragraph number two, shall be consent. Institutions consent, not consent. And uh, the last paragraph on page eight, Mr. Speaker, you dismissed the matter before you. Uh, so the uh, last line that the objections to it were without merit and missed, same in limine. So dismiss and not dismiss. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, table, table office. Kindly take note. Yes, any further correction? Yes. Right, Honorable Speaker. With respect, eight. Yes, go on. Mr. Speaker, the ruling, the subject matter of the correction by my colleague, I disagree with the suggestion that it should be dismissed in limine. If he reads the whole paragraph properly, I hold the view that the rendition there is appropriate. Well, I read, I read the ruling. I don't have the voice recording here to know whether I said, and I, I, and I dismissed him in limine or dismissed him in limine. But the table office is directed to take note of it and get the correct rendition of what I read. So let's move on to page nine. Honorable members, the votes and proceedings of the seventh sitting of the first meeting of the first session held on Tuesday, 26th January 2021, as corrected, are adopted as the true record of proceedings. members, I think the main purpose of today's meeting is on the urgent motion which has been outstanding for some time now. I am however committed to another assignment and so I will have to call on
So, honorable members, we'll go to item, let me say, at the commencement of public business first. I'm informed that the papers on the item five, presentation of papers, are not yet ready. And so we'll move to item six at page two of the standing orders to take the private member's motion, which has already been moved and seconded. What we have now is for the debate to continue. Unless the mover of the motion have something to add, I have been guided with some names and I'm told that the House has agreed we take 10 contributors for each plus leaders making five five so ten contributors in all we acknowledge the importance of the motion and I'm sure members are fully prepared to do justice to this motion yes I saw honorable member for Boko Central the mover of the motion. You have something to add before we go on? Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, at the last agenda date when the motion was moved, there was discussion about amending the motion. It was amended that day and you gave further instructions in relation to consensus building around the rendition of the motion. And subsequently, Mr. Speaker, we've had discussions across the aisle and we have a new rendition. So even though you um, adjourned at a time when we're still debating the motion, we're debating a different rendition of the motion. And so it will be appropriate today to start by moving the motion as presently captured. Because what we are going to debate today is materially different from what was, was moved the first time. So if you will indulge me, Mr. Speaker, I will move this motion again and then we can continue the debate carrying forward the arguments that were made that day, Mr. Speaker, with your kind permission. Honorable Member, did I hear you say it's materially different from the first motion? If it's, if, if, if it is materially different, then it means it's a different motion. If it is materially different, and it meant that we will have to start all over. Yeah, Mr. Yes. Mr. Speaker, um, there are two key words that were used uh, in the first motion, I mean, that are used in this motion that are not in the first motion. Uh, remember, Mr. Speaker, there was a question of whether we should use suspend or absorb. And then we said that uh, we should go and consider which one to be used. In this motion, the word is absorb the fees. Then also, there was a lot of questions that day about what do we do about private tertiary institutions accredited. And this motion captures some concern about the situation of accredited private universities. 
So, in that sense, there is some new thing in this rendition. How material is a question for you to decide. It is on the basis of that that I use the word material that there is some difference and therefore we should continue um, we should uh, consider uh, continuing but taking on board the fact that these two words have now been introduced in the motion. You have to give guidance, Mr. Speaker, on how we should proceed. But I just thought that it would be important to draw your attention to these two words that are in the new rendition. And it was based on your direction, Mr. Speaker, that we should go and then engage and then capture it in a way that reflects the concerns of all members of the House. Mr. Speaker, so we seek your guidance on the matter. Yes, Honourable Member for FUTU. Mr. Speaker, with respect, my respected colleague was clear in his words, which words prayed you for leave to move a motion on grounds of materiality of the text of his motion, which he himself justified by explaining to us two issues that have materially changed the text of his motion. But there is yet a third one, which perhaps he forgot to indicate. The issue of fees, which has also been introduced. So, Mr. Speaker, it is not about he seeking your guidance. We now have a new motion. Which motion you had even ruled that preliminary objection could not be upheld. But by what he is saying, he is rendering your ruling otios by saying that impliedly his motion was incompetent before this house and that he has materially altered the motion. Mr. Speaker, these are his words, not mine. I therefore hold a humble view that to the extent that he himself admits before this house that there has been something materially different from what he originally moved, everything must start anew. Mr. Speaker, it cannot be your guidance because he has actually invoked a rule of this house and he is saying that on that score, he wants your leave to proceed. So, Mr. Speaker, perhaps we may have to grant his prayer for us to proceed. On that line, uh, because uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, there's uh, no uh, um, We have the standing orders. They are very clear on this matter. What the Honorable Member for Boko Central has to do is to do what is stated in Order 78. 78I, page 53 and 54. What you have to do is to seek leave to withdraw the earlier motion which was moved and seconded. Not my leave, but also the leave of the house because it's been moved and seconded and is now before the house. It's the property of the house. And so under that order, you can withdraw the motion that you have moved without notice. And then you can now move to what you have yourself admitted that is materially different from the first one. And then we now give you the opportunity to move this second motion. It has to be seconded, and then the debate will start afresh. But my earlier ruling was with regard to 
the first motion that was moved and seconded. And so the ruling stands. But with regard to this, it's quite different from the earlier motion. So please, Honourable Member, do the, the proper one by seeking the leave of the House to withdraw the first motion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, right or not, Speaker, I would rather that I, I we will, we amend the the motion because you admitted you admitted. Uh, Honourable Member, I hope you are not attempting to challenge the ruling. What you need to do is after you've withdrawn your motion, before you move this second motion, then you can give us some background. That is where the consensus will come in, why this motion is not coming. But as of now, the proper thing to do is to withdraw the first motion that you moved, which was seconded. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think that your guidance uh, is duly taken on board and therefore with the leave of the house and press one to order 78 I I will I seek to withdraw the motion earlier admitted and advertised which rendition was uh, which rendition Mr. Speaker was as follows that this house resolves to request the president of the republic of ghana to take urgent steps to suspend the payment of admission fees by new entrants into public tertiary education institutions and continuing students of those institutions for the 2020 2021 academic year as part of the national COVID 19 relief programs being implemented by government. So, Speaker, I seek uh, leave of this House to withdraw that motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member for FU2. Yes. Right, Honorable Speaker, we are guided by the rules and your discretion in the rules by way of interpretation. Mr. Speaker, may we have a look at Order 82? Mr. Speaker, I was thinking that for the sake of our records, Honorable Member, in taking guidance from you, would have further fortified himself by citing order 82 because mr speaker you gave him guidance under 78i but then that was a guidance you had led him the way but he himself should have fortified himself because he said with the leave of the house so if it's with the leave then it's important for him to refer to order 82 as well because that is the very relevant provision under which he can, he can come. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, if he's seeking refuge, he seeks it well, Mr. Speaker. If he can come well. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, definitely you are right because I said it was not just my leave. It's the leave of the house and that is the proper standing order. But this is a matter of technicality. Let's uh, move on and uh, let's grant him the leave to withdraw and so it has accordingly been withdrawn and now you can move on to move the consensual motion and our members will have to go along this way 
for this for all good years. We have to be building consensus. And while building the consensus, making sure we are doing the proper thing in the interest of everybody in Ghana. So please, let's be guided by that. And uh, honorable member for Boko Center, you may now move a consensual motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Order 50, Mr. Speaker, I move that That this House resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps to absolve the fees of students of public tertiary education institutions for the 2020-2021 academic year and to extend support to accredited private universities as part of the national COVID-19 alleviation measures being implemented by the government of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, the new rendition of this motion is based on discussions following an earlier motion which you had admitted, or which called for the suspension of fees and which did not address the plight of accredited private tertiary institutions or private universities. And so following discussions both in this House and after sittings, this new rendition was agreed on and duly advertised after your having admitted the motion. So Speaker, the new rendition introduces the question of supporting accredited private universities, which was not factored into the earlier motion. And Mr. Speaker, the reason why we need to consider the plight of accredited private tertiary universities is the fact that they are businesses, like most other private businesses. And in relation to the outbreak of the pandemic, there were directives that all schools be closed. And so through no fault of theirs, their private businesses have been shut down for close to a year now. So Speaker, they have staff, they have workers, they have lecturers, they have infrastructure to maintain, and yet for the past one year, they have not been able to receive income for many of them unless those who managed to start online programs involving some minimal payments from students. So their businesses have been adversely affected. And so one of the issues that this motion seeks to address is some support going to these private public accredited universities, I mean, uh, private accredited universities. So, Speaker, if you recall, this House last approved sums of money for supporting small and medium scale industries as part of the alleviation measures following the COVID. Indeed, this House approved 600 million Ghana cities to be distributed to small and medium scale enterprises. And other measures were put in place to support industries in the pharmaceutical sector and other key sectors. Mr. Speaker, I think that private universities duly accredited are appropriate candidates for some government assistance 
in the light of this pandemic and its impact on, on them. If we are able to extend support to them, they will be able to also reduce their fees so that students who are not able to get into the public tertiary institutions where this motion requests for fees to be absorbed will be attending and therefore uh, if they get there, the private proprietors will be able to reduce the fees for them. So that is the basis for making this request and this motion that we take into consideration the plight of accredited private universities. So, Speaker, I want to take on board all the arguments earlier made uh, in support of the earlier motion so that I do not extensively repeat myself uh, before the House except to again indicate, Mr. Speaker, that when government absorbs the fees which are being charged by public tertiary institutions, students and parents still have a significant chunk of the cost to bear. Because there's the cost of transportation to school, there's the cost of hostel and accommodation either on campus uh, in private hostels or off campus in private hostels, then the students still bear cost in terms of materials that they have to purchase for studies and feeding themselves on campus and etc. So parents are still going to bear significant amounts of expenses uh, to support their children in the public tertiary institutions. And so if government is able to absorb uh, these fees and charges, it will be uh, a measure that will alleviate the sufferings of parents and children uh, pursuant to the situation created by the outbreak of the pandemic. So, Speaker, I need to also add that the fees are in two categories. You have the fees of ordinary uh, freshers who have been admitted and continuing students who are non-fee paying. Then you have also full fee paying uh, students. So you can be admitted into the University of Ghana to say do humanities and you will be charged averagely 2,000 if you are not a full fee paying student. And if you are a full fee paying student, you will also be charged about 4,000 because you are a full fee paying student. So the full fee paying students, some of them end up paying twice the amount that their colleagues offering the same course in that same university, a public university. Uh, will be paying. Mr. Speaker, it is similar in the sciences and, and the law faculty and the school of administration. You have the full fee paying and their fees has a significant component for tuition. They pay tuition fees in addition to all the other uh, items in the schedule of fees as approved by this parliament in the fees and charges provisional uh, regulations. Mr. So Speaker, I, I, I also want to emphasize the fact that uh, we, we, we need to do, vote in support of this motion so that it goes to the President. I mean, people ask me um, if it goes to the President, uh, what should he do? Mr. So Speaker, it's simple. It's a request by this House to the President that he should consider absorbing the fees of public tertiary, students in public tertiary institutions. It is for Mr. President to sit with the implementers of the education sector policies and programs and review the areas of the fees that he could decide to 
uh, suspend by bringing a uh, proposal in this house for the suspension of the application of those fees and then also consider the running cost of the public tertiary institutions and then make appropriations through this house to support those public tertiary institutions for them to be able to run for the 2020-2021 academic year. And Mr. Speaker, I know that there are financial difficulties, but we also know, Mr. Speaker, that the GET Fund was enacted and the 2.5% tax was imposed to be able to fund public tertiary education. We have resorted to using the fund for so many things. Last year, Mr. Speaker, by the records of this House, it was projected that we're making 1.3 billion Ghana cities uh, for the GET Fund. So I believe that uh, a significant percentage of that will be collected, uh, even though we are still within the pandemic situation. And so we can commit some portion of that money to support the public tertiary institutions and also some support to accredited private uh, universities so that it can meet their running cost once we decide or once the president decides that the fees should be absorbed and uh, uh, those are the options that are available to the president. So I'm just giving indications of options that are available to the president by way of implementing the resolution that this house may pass after the debate. So it is doable and in the context of this pandemic, this is something that we must all as a country reach out to families to support to be able to get their children to go to school. Many, many students will not be able to go back to school unless some support is extended to them via this mechanism. On that note, Mr. Speaker, I want to urge this House to support the motion as duly moved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any second Right, Honorable Speaker. I rise to second the motion. I, I hope this is a consensual motion. Yes, if Mr. This, Speaker. Okay. Go on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in doing so, I want to stand by issues that I raised when the motion was first moved on the 20th of uh, uh, In the meantime, first Deputy Speaker to take the chair. Mr. Speaker, we will recall that when the motion was moved and seconded, and in doing so, I mentioned that there are various fees that are paid at uh, the university. Uh, we have the, facility, uh, the academic facility user fees, residential facilities, and other charges that include fees charged by the student unions and um, other things. Mr. Speaker, I know and believe very strongly that this House approved various sums of money for government under the COVID-19 uh, funding um, measures. And I believe also that uh, there is enough money uh, available for this. So it shouldn't be difficult for government to make money available for support to uh, the public institutions especially the tertiary ones and the private universities in this country. We know very well that uh, COVID-19 affected all businesses in this country, whether farming, trading, or whatever. And there's the need for this government or the government of Ghana to alleviate the sovereigns of uh, Ghanaians. And the availability of this fund can be used judiciously to support them. So, Mr. Speaker, I urge the House that we should look at this request passionately and then make sure that we request government to come to the aid of Ghanaians in these difficult times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, 
the motion moved and seconded is now for the consideration of the house as i mentioned earlier on i have the guide from the leaders of the various parliamentary groups and uh, from the majority side we have Honorable Kojo Opong and Kroma. If you are present, please may you make your contributions now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the motion that is currently uh, before the House. Mr. Speaker, I want to start by commending my colleague, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Boku Central, for the initial motion and even this materially different version that he's put before the House. And I commend him because, in my view, it amounts to an admission that, contrary to some of the initial views and criticisms expressed of the President's action to provide relief for various segments of the Ghanaian population on the onset of COVID-19, indeed, it's actually a good thing. Mr. Speaker, if I may refresh colleagues' memories, we would recall that His Excellency the President, as part of his interventions, caused government, central government, to pay the water bills of Ghanaians from April 2020 and now through to March 2021. On electricity, for example, His Excellency the President caused central government to pay bills for lifeline consumers from April to December 2020, and now that's been further extended to March 2021. For other categories, government was also paying 50% using March bills uh, of 2020 as a benchmark. Mr. Speaker, not only that, for health workers, His Excellency the President extended a hand, insurance packages, 50% of their basic salary per month as an additional allowance for those who are frontline health workers, even waiving taxes for health workers, and as has been mentioned by my colleagues, providing a stimulus package for businesses. Unfortunately, at the time, Mr. Speaker, these interventions by the President were described as populist. I want to draw the House's attention, for example, to some of these comments as reported in the newspapers and online portals. For example, Ghana Web, 15th August 2020, which says what you should do is to create jobs for Ghanaians so that they have the purchasing power to afford goods and services rather than throwing at them freebies. And this was articulated by His Excellency, the former President, John Dramani Mahama. Ms. Vika, at various times, some of our colleagues on the other side questioned how free water and electricity would not have long-term consequences on the Ghanaian economy. My good friend from Yape Kushogu on the other side, the Honorable John Jinapo on PCFM on the 10th of April 2020, made an argument that by spending more time or more resources on electricity cuts, on, on, on supporting electricity and spending more money in that area, the Ghanaian consumer in the end was going to be worse off. Mr. Speaker, so it comes as a relief that haven't gone round the curve, our colleagues on the other side are the ones who are now proposing that indeed reliefs are a good thing, they are not freebies, they are not populist, but they will help some category of Ghanaians. Honorable Speaker, there's also perhaps a preliminary matter I'll deal with before I substantively deal with whether or not I'll support this motion. It is on the question of whether or not the House can make a request of the President by resolution. And I take that from the comments of the mover of this new motion and our good friend who supported it. Ordinarily, a resolution in accordance with the definitions of Eskin May, I think page 424, second paragraph, is the opinion or the purposes of the House. 
can the house the house of the people not make a record uh, not make a request of the president to do anything i believe the house can but mr speaker the mover of the motion in his submission says that his intent is only to bring it to the attention of the president so that he may sit with the education policy makers if i heard him correctly and implementers and decide what is appropriate to do Mr. Speaker, with the greatest of respect to my colleague, that sounds to me like something that is best articulated by a statement. Because then a request, and if you examine how a request, if you examine how a request is treated alongside orders, etc., a request goes beyond simply bringing it to the attention of His Excellency the President that he and the education policy makers and implementers may implement. So, Mr. Speaker, while I agree that, yes, reliefs are a good thing, it is a good thing that our colleagues on the other side are joining us, that reliefs should be provided to various categories of Ghanaians. And while I am of the view that perhaps a statement can achieve this purpose, not a request of the President, I also agree that Parliament can make a request of the President. But Mr. Speaker, a request of the President, in my humble opinion, must meet some standards. If this House is to ferry a request to the President, it must meet some standards. In my mind, Mr. Speaker, first, it must be clear and specific, not ambiguous. Second, it must not encourage an illegality or an unconstitutionality. Third, Mr. Speaker, it must not be discriminatory. And finally, Mr. Speaker, it must follow best practices. And with your latitude, I'd like to provide a few reasons for which, Mr. Speaker, I will not be able to support this motion as is presently worded. The principle sounds like a good idea, but this motion as is presently worded, Mr. Speaker, myself and I believe a good number of my colleagues on this side will not be able to support it. So first, Mr. Speaker, on the question of specificity, what fees are we referring to? The argument has been made over and over again that there are admission fees, there are academic facility user fees, there are fees or some dues that are paid that go to the SRC, etc. Indeed, in his submissions this morning or this afternoon, he distinguishes between full fee paying students and those who don't pay fees as well. So what fees are we specifically talking about? Are we talking about all the fees or some specific fees? Are we talking even of the uh, residential facility user fees that used to be in existence some time past? Mr. Speaker, there's the need to be clear because to make such a request of the president, we cannot be ambiguous in our language going to His Excellency the President. Mr. Speaker, another test which I believe this motion as is currently worded does not meet is a test of legality or even constitutionality. Mr. Speaker, you would notice that the new rendition of the motion now talks about absorb. The earlier rendition was about suspend. What I was going to ask was that what did suspend mean in that rendition? Was it to hold back and bring it back a few years down the line? In which case the same people who can't pay today will end up paying double. But today it's been amended to absorb. But Mr. Speaker, what does absorb mean? Does it mean central government to pay? And Mr. Speaker, you would notice from some of the early arguments that have been made, indeed the second of the motion, premises his secondment on the fact that this House has voted monies for COVID-19, and therefore those monies can be applied for this purpose. Mr. Speaker, if I recall, all the monies that this House voted for COVID-19 were for specific purposes which we debated and voted on. So to come back to this House and say that because we voted some monies for COVID-19 interventions, it therefore should be applied or covers everything, the Speaker is a bit, uh, if I may use the language respectfully, taking the latitude a bit too wide. Mr. Speaker, Article 108 of the Constitution says, Parliament shall not, not Parliament may not, Parliament shall not, unless the bail is introduced or the motion is introduced or on behalf of the president proceed upon a bill including an amendment to a bill that in the opinion of the person presiding makes provision for any of the following imposition of taxation 
And if you read 108AII, it says, the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by a reduction. Mr. Speaker, Parliament in our Constitution is a stopped through the use of a strong word, shall, is a stop from doing an act, in this case in the form of a bill, entertaining a bill, which amounts to an imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other, other funds. So, Mr. Speaker, if we say we want to recommend to the President to absorb, and absorb, as I understand it to be argued, means to use funds from where, the consolidated fund or somewhere else, to pay. How does this sit with a constitutional provision like this? Mr. Speaker, again, in the Constitution, Article 17 speaks against discrimination. Speaks against discrimination, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you observe the way this motion is now framed, it talks about paying the fees. Talks about absorbing the fees of students in public tertiary institutions. And then when it comes to those in private universities, it says to extend support to accredited private universities. Mr. Speaker, first of all, my argument of specificity applies to this support. What sort of support are we talking about? But even more specifically, now on the matter of discrimination. Why is it that when it comes to public universities, assuming we know what fees we are talking about, why are we not saying that those same fees be paid for those in the private universities? And then for them, we are saying that we should extend support to the institution. And the mover of the motion argues that it is his hope that when that support is extended, they will reduce fees. Mr. Speaker, we cannot work with such a hope. Respectfully. We cannot work with such a hope. It amounts to discrimination if you say you will pay some fees or all fees or specific fees for those in the public universities. And then when it comes to the, those in the private universities, you don't do same. And you say it should be a matter of support to those institutions. So, Mr. Speaker, that in my humble view will even fly in the face of Article 17 of our Constitution. Mr. Speaker, I want to draw my colleagues' attention to the Public Financial Management Act. Section 33. And Section 33 talks about multi-year expenditure commitments. If I'm correct, Mr. Speaker, our colleagues in the universities attend these institutions spanning more than one year. Are we, by this resolution, committing or asking the government to commit to a multi-year um, commitment? And have we purported in any way to fulfill the obligations of Section 33? where even when a Minister of State is going to do something that goes for multi-year commitment, he needs the express prior written approval of the Minister responsible for finance. We, we don't even have a Minister for Finance currently. We only have the President's representative at the Ministry responsible for finance. We have not procured Section 33 approval. How will such a resolution, if we pass it, sit with Section 33? Mr. Speaker, very quickly, I want to go to Section 100, again, of the Public Financial Management Act. Any legislation to be laid before Parliament or proposal submitted for the approval of Parliament shall, not may, shall be accompanied by a fiscal impact analysis stating the estimated effect on revenues and expenditures for the financial year in which the legislation or proposal is expected to come into effect. The Speaker, the spirit is to ensure that we don't throw our finances out of balance. What is the fiscal impact presumption or projection? That is associated with this resolution that we want to send to the president. My uneducated calculation about 500,000 young people are across our tertiary institutions in this country, public and private. If the average fee, and we are not even sure which fee we are talking about, is 3,500 cities, that's 1.7 billion Ghana cities, about 0.5% of GDP. Am I correct? Am I wrong? How does this sit with the government's numbers? What is the fiscal impact analysis that ought to have been or has been done? Mr. Speaker, again, that test is not met with this motion as it currently reads. So, Mr. Speaker, in terms of being clear and specific, my humble opinion is that this motion doesn't meet the test. In terms of legality, even asking a president to suspend the implementation of LI 
I think 2216, is a matter that, in my humble view, flies in the face of legality. In terms of not being discriminatory, this motion, as it stands currently, discriminates against students of private tertiary institutions. And in terms of best practice, Mr. Speaker, as I've mentioned earlier, things like fiscal impact analysis, etc., are not included as a stand. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, it is a good thing that we all acknowledge now, despite the earlier comments, that it was populist, it was a cheap approach. It's a good thing that we all acknowledge now that reliefs for Ghanaians should be done at a time like this. And I encourage my colleague uh, to keep on this path. I'm happy we're on this path. But, Mr. Speaker, this motion as it stands, to the extent that it appears to say, because we have voted for monies for COVID-19, it should be able to cover all of these things. One, we know those monies were for specific purposes. And B, Mr. Speaker, because in my mind, these basic pillars that must be met as a test are not met, myself and I believe a good number of my colleagues will not be able to support this motion as it currently stands. I thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Norton, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa. Most grateful, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak to this motion. This motion, Mr. Speaker, fundamentally is about what this House, as members of Parliament, will do to alleviate the plight of students across all tertiary institutions as the 2020-2021 academic year commences. In the face of the pandemic that continues to ravage the world. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, COVID-19 has infected more than 100 million people on the globe. More than 2.1 million people have died. In Ghana, we know that there have been over 300 deaths and counting. There is talk of a second wave, which we have not been exempted from. Two new strains of the virus have been detected, one from the United Kingdom and one from South Africa. The experts tell us that these variants are more deadly. And the COVID-19 situation is totally disrupting economies it's creating untold hardship. It has led to extreme poverty. Economies are collapsing, and our economy is not excluded. Indeed, this economy is in recession. As we speak, many have lost jobs. Many workers have been laid off. And there is considerable difficulty and that is why governments across the globe have been intervening to mitigate and to cushion their citizens. I do know, Mr. Speaker, that all of us have been committed one way or the other in helping to alleviate the plight of our constituents, even at the constituency level. I am shell shocked that my colleague, the Honorable Kojo Pongkrumah, sought to create the impression that the interventions that His Excellency Nana Adodanko Akufuado, as leader of this country, made in his first term was not supported by this side of the House. That cannot be, 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 be a statement of fact. Indeed, all the coronavirus relief interventions that came to this House received the full support of this House. The record will bear me out. This side of the House supported every single intervention, all the allocations. His Excellency, the former President, which he 
sought to indict His Excellency President John Dramani Mahama did not only publicly support social interventions, he himself was at the forefront at the personal level in making donations, personal protective equipment to the Ridge Hospital, to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, to the whole hospital, the Volta Regional Hospital, virtually all the regional hospitals in this country. So how can somebody who was at the forefront of making social interventions, he does not manage our taxes, he has not been given public funds to manage, and yet he managed to dig deep and raise personal resources to help alleviate the plight of Ghanaians. How can this same person be accused today? by the caretaker information minister that President Muhammad does not believe in social interventions or alleviating the plight of our people. The good people of this country know the track record of President Muhammad and the NDC. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, some of us at the personal level in our constituencies, I have been inspired by the contributions that members of parliament have made in their constituencies. In my own constituency, I managed to raise resources to even pay private school teachers who have been home for several months without salaries. And I have seen other interventions by colleagues. So, as leaders, we know that a time like this demands of us to stand up and speak for the vulnerable, to stand up and creatively find ways of ensuring that our citizens who vote for us fundamentally to improve their lot, to ensure that their welfare is protected, we must not be seen or heard using technicalities, warped arguments, and outright falsehoods to, as it were, stifle, stifle their progress. Mr. Speaker, it is important to stress that fundamentally, education. Honourable Member, please hold on. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I believe that I am the first person on this particular motion to speak in opposition to the motion. My colleague on the other side talks about outright falsehoods and warped arguments. Mr. Speaker, I believe that if it is me he's referring to, that will not be parliamentary. I believe, as has been mentioned already, we are working in consensus. So if it is me that is describing as having put falsehoods before this House, it will be important to specify what falsehood I have put before this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, you know what is acceptable language you now. So kindly withdraw those words which are unparliamentary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I heard my honorable colleague say that we did not support President Akufado's freebies. We opposed it. And that's, that's, not, that's not the truth, if I should put it that way. That is not the truth. That is not accurate. So I, 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 I really <coughs> am at a loss, so unless I didn't hear you uh, clearly. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I believe my colleague did not hear me right. I quoted the former president, John Dramani Mahama, who is not a member of this house, and his public comments in describing what the president was doing as freebies. My colleague on the other side says that the members of this house did not vote against the president's application for funds. I do not believe that putting the two together, he can describe my quotation of the former president as an outright falsehood. I don't believe so, Mr. Speaker. I think it's, it, is, it is incorrect, and he should withdraw saying you have taken the former president totally out of context. I have put it to you that the former president did not only support the president's social interventions, he himself led his party to Honourable offer donations to Honourable hospitals, Honourable to orphanages, for. to people who were Honourable affected. Member for 
Northam. The issue is, did he misquote the former president? If he did not, then it is not a falsehood. That's all I'm asking you to withdraw. Well, Mr. Speaker, I will comply with your decision in difference to you and uh, with utmost respect. Uh, but the facts are known to everybody in this country that President Mahama did not only support social interventions, he led the way. There are very few opposition leaders who don't manage taxes, who did what President Mahama did in this country in the year 2020. But Mr. Speaker, I want to progress. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Mr. Speaker, makes education a right. The United Nations admonishes all governments to ensure that whatever barriers, whatever limitations will get in the way of their nationals, they should do well to get those barriers out of the way. And that is why in Ghana, when we promulgated the 1992 Constitution, Article 25 of the 1992 Constitution virtually rehashed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and made education a right. And Mr. Speaker, since 1992, if you look at the Constitution, we are one of few countries that put in our Constitution FQ, Free Compulsory Universal Basic Education that it should be free and successive governments must be commended for that effort president akufuado must also be commended for building on that what president rollins president mills president kufuo before president mills president mahama did by progressively free secondary education and introduced free shs all of that is in fulfillment to Article 25 of our Constitution. What is interesting is that Article 25 1C of our Constitution even makes higher education in Ghana progressively free. That as we build this economy, as we work hard to expand the national cake, a day shall come that students, Ghanaian students at the tertiary level should not be called upon to pay fees. That is a fantastic dream of the forebears of our constitution and our country. And so in all we do, we should, as a matter of principle and philosophically have this understanding that even in good times that is the philosophy of our country. Our raison d'etre is that we will get to a day when education at all levels, basic, second cycle, tertiary, higher education, will be free, even in good times. That is what Article 25 1C of our Constitution says. So how much more in these difficult times where more than 2 million people in the world have died? And as I speak to you, Mr. Speaker, Countries are being very innovative. The Africa Development Bank has a report out where 33 African countries have been singled out for praise for giving out cash grants, including students, 33 African countries, as a way of alleviating their plight during this pandemic. The United States of America, Mr. Speaker, has passed the CARES Act, the CARES Act, C-A-R-E-S, the CARES Act, where student loans, for the first time in many decades, have been suspended. The interests have been suspended. Students are being cushioned in the United States of America. In Canada, there is a special intervention that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has introduced to cushion students in Canada. Germany has done the same. The United Kingdom, the United Kingdom has also given over 100 million pounds to universities 
to alleviate the plight of students and lecturers. I have talked about the 33 African countries. Please listen to me. Follow my argument. I started with 33 African countries. So, so Mr. Speaker, I will appeal that those who want to contribute to the debate when it gets to their turn. It's affecting my strain of thought, Mr. Speaker. So, so, Mr. Speaker, there is best practice globally in this period. We have seen what African countries are doing. We have seen what the countries that have just listed are doing to alleviate the plight of students. And it is interesting that during the 2020 campaign, Mr. Speaker, the two parties, the MPP and the NDC, acknowledged this grim reality. And if you look at the MPP manifesto, they had very impressive promises which look like what we are debating today. One, in the MPP manifesto, they said that students will no longer need guarantors because of the conditions that we face now. They also said that students will now get loans. They are proposing that when elected in the, in the second term of President Akufuado, without prejudice to the Supreme Court case, students will be given loans, pre-entry loans, so that you don't need to pay your admission fees before you get money to get in. Now you have the votes, I'm the elections are over. Wind up. I've just sought advice that the contributors should have 10 minutes each. Because the first two started without this advice, each of you have already exceeded 15 minutes. So, can they have two more minutes to conclude? I I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. So, so, Mr. Speaker, the MPP manifesto acknowledges the times we are in and made some good, what I would call, far-reaching and positive proposals. I recall the MDC manifesto as well, talked about the chamber policy, which was even later revised that all the free SHS graduates would not pay fees at all. So what the Honorable Mahama Yariga is asking for are matters that the two main political parties brought to the fore during the campaign. The, 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 the various standard bearers spoke to them, and students were in anticipation that because of these hard times caused by COVID, when the 2020 and 2021 academic year commences, whether it's MPP or NDC in power, we will all make do our promises and we will deliver on those promises. So what has changed? Is it the case that we don't want to keep faith with the electorate, with the Ghanaian people? So this argument of discrimination, let my brother, Honorable Kojo Opon Krumah, take note that free SHS does not cover private schools. So does it mean President Akufado is discriminating against students in the private schools? So you're, you, are, you are shooting your own policies in, in the foot. Then they claim that we cannot support private institutions. We have been doing it. As Deputy Minister of Education in charge of tertiary education, I recall that in the allocation of vehicles, anytime we buy buses for schools, we include the private tertiary institutions. We, we, we do extend support to them. So we have been doing that. We, we sometimes extend even grants when we, when we negotiate with the World Bank and there are some grants available for faculty. We allow them to also apply. So there's a long-standing tradition where we extend support to private tertiary institutions. <laughs> These things are done. So the Honorable Mahama Yariga must be commended for bringing this motion. Is competent as the speaker has ruled and this house should it should not be said by our constituents that we sat aloof we ran away from our campaign promises and when the time came for us to stand up for them and to seek their interests we chickened out and engaged in bad faith i thank you very much mr speaker yeah. honorable member for bosom chain Dr. Adichung said. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this motion. 
I'm Mr. Speaker, my honorable colleague talked about what has changed. Uh, my honorable colleague, nothing has changed. Uh, we as a government don't even have our ministers in place, so nothing has changed. We have not begun the process of implementing our manifesto. And when the appropriate time comes, my brother, we will not check it out. Whatever we promised, we will deliver with your support. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know there are many people in this house who have supported education, supported tertiary education, have paid the fees of our students in our constituency, and as someone who recently paid the fees of 30 students to pursue engineering at UMAT, I'll be the last one to come up here and speak against this motion. It's an interesting uh, when colleagues stand up and say we need so to support our children. But Mr. Speaker, at the first survey you will say, yeah, there's COVID-19. But Mr. Speaker has spoken with a number of vice chancellors who are telling me they don't know what is going on in this house. The vice chancellors are saying that on a scale of preference, this is not what they are going to access to do for them. So I hope my honorable colleague, my honorable colleague, my honorable colleague did a survey, did a survey uh, that established that, which established that there's an urgent need. Uh, let me give an example. Um, Mr. Speaker, a number of universities have opened, all of them. Students have registered, they are in place. If my honorable colleague came to their house to say that the students have not shown up in school, it's a different argument. I will give you the example of University of Professional Studies Accra. In 2018-19, 67% of the students that they admitted registered. You know, in Ghana, because we don't have a common admission process. Hold on. Yes, hold on. Yes, an old member for the Ngo Pram Pram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. This house is a house of records. Hearing the former Deputy Minister for Education say that he's spoken to Vice Chancellors and they say what we're doing in this house is not what they need and that it is not on their priority list. Right, Honorable Speaker, it will only be right that he lets us know which Vice Chancellor of which university said that to him for the records of this House. Yeah, of that. Honorable Honorable, please continue. Mr. Speaker, when you look at the number of students who have registered and paid at University of Professional Studies Accra, UPSA, a 70% of students who were offered admission have duly paid and they are in school. In 2018-19, only 67% did actually pay and went to school. In 2019-20, uh, 63% paid out of those who admitted paid and went to school. In the midst of the pandemic, 70% have paid and they are in school. So when the motion talks about absorbing fees, are we absorbing the fees of those who are already paid? <laughs> Students who are already paid and they are in school and they are studying and are we absorbing the school uh, the fees of students who have already paid? This, this, this is a very interesting uh, uh, suggestion and a motion to make at this point, at this point when students have already registered and they have paid their fees. And we are talking about absorbing of the fees. I don't know whose fees we are absorbing. Mr. Speaker, we know that our students should be supported. And we must, in I fact, salute. Yeah, don't have a member on his feet. What is it? Thank you, Rano Speaker. Rano Speaker, the former minister kept mentioning percentages, 70% of students pay their fees, 30% what have you. Uh, no justification, no evidence, no source. How does he want this August House to believe in whatever that he's saying? I think that the, the other former minister should provide some evidence to indicate that actually the percentages... Are our members, please, for those who want to intervene, please be guided by the standing orders. If the member has not some, said something offensive, something factually incorrect, please don't intervene. 
respond in your contribution. Thank you very much. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are in a pandemic, yes. And I want to salute the parents of this country that in the midst of a pandemic, they have sent their children to school and they have paid for them to be in school. I want to salute the honorable colleagues in this side, both sides of the aisle, who has also supported their students to go to school. And I want to say that this motion has not made a case that students are on the streets, students are not in school, students are in school, they have registered, they have paid, they are studying, and therefore, Mr. Speaker, in as, much I in as much as I support assistance to needy students, in as much as I support that we have to do our utmost to ensure that every student has an opportunity to attend tertiary education when they have satisfied all their requirements, in as much I know that tertiary education is one of the most critical uh, factors for the transformation of a nation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know that if your gross tertiary enrollment ratio is not up to about 40 to 50 percent, the transformation of your country will elude you. So any attempt to support students should be commended. But Mr. Speaker, as I look at this motion and reflect on it, this motion is just going to cause confusion. Uh, because when this motion gets to the desk of the president, and we are talking about absorbing of fees and uh, we are saying fees of who? Fees of first year students, continuing students. Uh, is the fees of those who have paid or the fees of those who are saying we cannot pay? Mr. Speaker, based on this, I stand and I say that this motion should be rejected. Yeah. Honorable Haji Aladi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to contribute to the motion on the floor and I support the motion. Mr. Speaker, listening to the arguments on the floor, I have asked myself several questions, including the very fact that the arguments against this motion go on to talk about discrimination while the same persons who are making the argument and saying the motion is discriminatory are the same persons who are upholding and praising the fact that government have given free water free electricity, free senior high, and what have you. Mr. Speaker, is it everyone in Ghana or every Ghanaian who has a child in senior high school? No. Secondly, you talk of paying or absorbing the cost of water. What percentage of Ghanaians have pipe-borne water for which they pay water bills? If this is not discriminatory enough, then I would be asking myself severally where we have put those Ghanaians who have actually voted for us and we are here, who are in the villages, do not have even portable drinking water from boreholes, not even recommended wells, are drinking from the same sources with animals, and yet we sit and agree and argue that once we have given free water to those in towns, some of, some of, I will say some of, and that's underlined, because even those in the urban areas, it's not all of us who have water running through our pipes. Mr. Speaker, we speak about free electricity. 
And we want to say we haven't been discriminatory in that respect. When we know very well that rural electrification is one of the issues that we are still battling and struggling to make sure most of our Ghanaians who need the support, who need our support, are still looking for. And yet, we uphold that better than the fact that if every Ghanaian is educated or is given an opportunity, who has the opportunity and the ability, if we give them that support, at the end of the day, all these supports that we might be talking about in this house today, they will be able to support families so that we wouldn't continue to have these problems. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about an issue that has come out because of the pandemic. With the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, it's not an issue of people have been able to pay. Let us ask ourselves, how did they get those monies? Haven't most of them borrowed? We are fully aware in this house that some of them even come back to us to tell us that we should support them to go and pay or offset those monies that they have borrowed. Let us be sincere with ourselves. The motion on the floor is not an issue of NDC or NPP. The issue on the floor is not about whether it is whose president has won or has not won. The issue on the floor is about our own persons, those that cannot, and those who do not have it. Mr. Speaker, the issue of discrimination also came when it was discussed, being mentioned here, but my, by my most respected colleague, and with all due respect, that we do not know what fees we should be paying for, because we are not able to tell who pays what. I believe that no matter how much the fee is, whether it is 1,000 Ghana cities or 2,000 Ghana cities, it is very relevant and important. And in supporting, we should look at it that even the free water that was being given, we all do not pay the same amounts. We pay different amounts. When it comes to our water bills, our light bills, and what have you. Mr. Speaker, this issue has ruined a lot of families because parents are not able to pay these fees. And because most of these people who are going to school are adolescent, either early adolescent or late adolescent, Mr. Speaker, they simply do not believe and do would not understand their parents. Parents have gone at loggerheads with each other on how they would be able to pay these monies. Mr. Speaker, the 70% that my colleague on the other side would have referred to as those who have paid for the academic year 2020-2021, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you is also include, it includes the monies that MPs would have supported some of these students to pay. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic is not a respect of anybody. Whether you are what party, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that this has eaten to the very fabric of our economy in such a way that most people are not able to undertake their businesses anymore. We here are seated and we are talking about people who are finding it difficult to even go out there and sell. Even the woman who is selling okra, selling tomato, 
selling onion is finding it difficult because she is not able to sell due to social distancing due to travel problems yes we would say what we want to say but we should be preaching social distancing we should be preaching social distancing and all these issues come to play farmers are not able to travel as they want to travel because their products are right they have to go to the market and yet maybe the vehicle that has to carry the goods will carry the goods without the owner of the goods and that person will have to go on a different track and might not get that track because the track is full and most of these are farmers their goods are perishable mr speaker i wish to plead with us here and to say we should as earlier discussed and as the maker of the motion stated that there was consensus for him to have changed the statement from its original form to what it is if there was consensus mr speaker let us respect ourselves and know that what we are doing is for every Ghanaian. Mr. Speaker, I support the motion 100% and I am for it. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Alexander Fenyomaki. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to add my voice to the motion on the floor. Mr. Speaker, let me state that having listened to my colleagues who have contributed so far from the minority side, it is clear to me that all submissions made by them were not seated within the terms of the motion as proposed, moved, and seconded by the two members on their side. Mr. Speaker, we are being led into an array of populism, unguided. And Mr. Speaker, the same argument as it being advanced is also talking about the state of our economy. So, Mr. Speaker, what is the mover of the motion requiring of us as a house to do? I may refer to his own motion. Mr. Speaker, this is what his motion says. At the risk of being repetitive, I shall quote in full, that this house resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps to absorb fees of students of public tertiary institutions for the 2021 academic year and to extend support to accredited private universities as part of national COVID-19 alleviation measures being implemented by the government of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, with the greatest respect, the motion itself in its form and in substance is defective. Why the differential use of language? Why use the language absorb that of public tertiary student? And then the same motion talks about extend support to private universities. Mr. Speaker, clarity and certainty are key. If we are inviting Mr. President and his government to do a certain act, we ourselves must be clear exactly what we want the government to do. And I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, that this motion has moved. is not clear. It's not certain. We are not sure of the intent of Honorable Mahama Ayarega. And, Mr. Speaker, listening to my respected colleague, Ablaqua, he argued and in support, these were his words. As a result of COVID-19, 
Economies are being disrupted. Economies are collapsing. These are his words. Then he refers again to Article 25, 1C. Mr. Speaker, the Article 25, 1C, which he quoted to support his argument, says, higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity vary by every appropriate means and in particular progressive introduction of free education so mr speaker the interlocking relationship here one in one breath his argument is that economies are failing and that does not exclude ghana he says that covid is disrupting economies that does not exclude ghana then the constitutional provision he relied on to advance his case also talks about capacity so mr speaker in the wake of COVID, is it his case that though we are having disrupting economy though our economy is failing we still have capacity to carry out the mandate as being imposed on us by our respected colleague ayariga Mr. Speaker, the inconsistency is very apparent. It's so clear that you cannot approbate and reprobate. You cannot eat your cake and have it. If you want to invite us to follow you on a particular path, it is important to be consistent, clear in what you want us to do. The mover of the motion himself says that he expects government to sit together with the implementers of its educational policy. Mr. Speaker, if indeed this is what Honorable Ayariga wants us to do, then it is important for ad to advert his mind to Order 72. Mr. Speaker, this is what Order 72 says. By the indulgence of the House and leave of Mr. Speaker, a member at any time appointed for statement under Order 53 explain a matter of personal nature make a statement on a matter of urgent public importance any statement other than personal statement may be commented upon by other members for a limited duration of time not exceeding an hour mr speaker i will end there and make this point that if indeed the intent of my colleague is to bring to the attention of this house this matter as urgent and as important as he deems it which i agree with him he should come by way of statement this is the appropriate channel to advance this course then we would be engaging what he is doing mr speaker is exactly what mr speaker admonishes us not to do carrying out an obstructionist agenda trying to ambush government because the appropriate route is to come up with a statement if you come up with a statement we engage each other because mr speaker the explanatory submission by him talks about the fact that he is not restricting government he is encouraging government to take the opportunity to sit with the implementers this way is words. the implementers and then he also talks about the fact that there's going to be a fiscal cost, a fiscal impact, which, Mr. Speaker, my colleague, Kodjo Oponkrumah, advanced that argument in extenso. He took time to explain to us the fiscal impact on our economy. Now, are you, Mr. Speaker, this is my question to the minority, are you ready to accept any imposition of tax to support this cause because if we all agree as my colleague from Pusiga whom I refer to as my mother said she said that businesses are collapsing I agree I recently went to a colleague's office a lawyer so respected and she said he told me Alex I used to have over 35 lawyers in this office today all of them are sitting at home I'm not getting referrals as a lawyer, I know the impact. I used to do several cases. Now they are not coming. If you agree that the economy is failing, that businesses are failing, 
And you also say that government should absorb. Honorable, you know that government. Honorable member, hold on. Yes, honorable <laughs> deputy leader. Deputy chief whip, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The speaker, my honorable deputy leader, made a serious allusion to this side of the house by breaching the very rules that is giving the opportunity to speak, by imputing improper motives to the mover of this motion. Mr. Speaker, we have so many tools at our disposal. You can use statement, you can use motions. The honorable member for Boku Central have chosen to come by a motion. And Mr. Speaker, your good self have admitted it. Is he saying that you are supporting the member for Boku Central in implementing obstructionist agenda? Mr. Speaker, I think it's unfair and he must withdraw and apologize not only to the honorable member for Boku Central, to your good self as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Honorable member, did you use those words? Obstruct, uh, what was that? Ob obstructionist agenda. Did you use those words? Mr. Speaker, if my colleague wants to quote those, those words as he put it, then he will be right in requiring of me to withdraw. But I use those words and I would want to repeat for the benefit of his further hearing. I am saying that Mr. Speaker admonished us that as a house, we should not be seen to be carrying out an obstructionist agenda. And that, and that, and that in my view, having listened to his ex explanatory argument in support of his motion, I 100% believe that the appropriate for a, uh, channel is order 72. However, the approach is adopting create the impression that if this is carried out, then we may be moving on the route of an obstructionist agenda. That is not improper know, motive uh, or something I'm putting to him. No, that's not what the, I said. The last part you just Very mentioned well. suggests that they are going on a route of an obstructionist agenda and I dare that to withdraw. Mr. Speaker, we are guided and accordingly to the extent that that impression that impression is held I accordingly take out that uh, portion and I thank him for bringing that to the fore and I appreciate your ruling. Mr. Speaker, that notwithstanding it is my considered view that an invitation such as we find may lead to the imposition of taxation if government is supposed to embrace what is being required of it to do. Because, Mr. Speaker, I've been government has announced that because of some of these challenges, even application for student loan will no more require a guarantor that you don't need a guarantor to support your application that in itself is some relief honorable uh, member for Pusiga have even talked about the burden on them but mr speaker we know that mbssr has been giving out cash grants to support businesses and to help parents to keep on with their businesses so that they can pay mr speaker again government has announced scholarship that those who cannot afford, please go and apply for scholarship. Mr. Speaker, clearly, for all these interventions that have already been announced, this motion becomes otios. We need not proceed further with it, but rather engage government. In any event, Mr. Speaker, the government is at its formative days. Ministers are yet to be approved by this government. As Honorable Dr. Edutum said, government policy per its um, blueprint in the manifesto is yet to be rolled out. Must we, Mr. Speaker, must we as a house 
stampede government at this point, I think in the spirit of consensus building, which we used to initiate our very aid parliament, we should not be seen to be passing a resolution, uncertain resolution, unclear resolution. Is it only for the optics? Is it for the media? Is it to create a certain impression about us? No. We should be seen to be acting in good faith in a manner that government will see that indeed this is the House's position. But Mr. Speaker, the form and substance as we find would not arrive at that destination. And I think that in view of the uncertainties, in view of the lack of clarity, in view of the submissions made by supporters of this motion, specifically Honorable Ablaka, who argues with some force that we have our economy failing, we are our economy collapsing, we have businesses collapsing. We know also as a fact that GRA is not meeting its, uh, its targets because businesses are failing, revenues are not coming in. We know how it is becoming difficult for common fund releases to go and all of us are here complaining. Why then do we again say that government must absorb all tertiary fees undergraduates, graduates, then you go and again say that government should provide support to a private tertiary institution. Mr. Speaker, this is a very lame motion. This motion in the list is driven by a populist Mr. Speaker, a populist breath. This members, motion your time is up. Can you does not seek to achieve its own purpose and say must be rejected until the right thing is done for government to consider. I thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Rashid Pelpo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to this very, very innovative idea of presenting an, uh, a policy initiative from Parliament to government. Mr. Speaker, I've been in this House for a while. This motion is one of a few that I have ever seen being presented from this House by a member on a public matter of importance to the government. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy you admitted the motion. I'm very happy that at the onset of this motion, members of this House, especially our friends from the other side, decided to arrest the motion at a point because they said they needed to streamline it, to make it, uh, you know, put it in a better position to capture a larger majority of Ghanaians because they thought about uh, the fact that it's discriminatory if it did not include the private institutions. They talked about the need for us to specify what fees it was. The speaker, they contributed in shaping up the present motion as it is. Many of us thought that in that contribution or in those contributions, they were mainly gerrymandering, mainly wasting time, so that at the end of it, the former Deputy Minister of Education will now come and say that students have already paid their fees, so why are you bringing these fees here? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a motion that we all support from this side. Mr. Speaker, it is a motion that will make Ghanaians happy, and I think that all students listening to us who have knocked doors, who have gone borrowing, who have gone to their MPs, will be happy that this motion is being debated and will be happy that we support this motion and allow the President 
to take steps, Mr. Speaker, to take steps to make sure that their fees are absorbed. Mr. Speaker, I listen to a lot of red herring arguments, starting from the former Minister for Information. Mr. Speaker, he made mention of the fact that this, the motion contradicts. Mr. Speaker. The motion contradicts order 112 of our standing orders. Mr. Speaker, nothing is further than the truth than that. Order 112 of the Constitution is talking about bills. Uh, sorry, of, of, this, of our standing orders. It's talking about bills, imposing bills, making amendments that will impose tax or cost to the consolidated fund. It is not talking about a motion that is urging government to take steps. The taking steps is going to be for government to take its time and do the appropriate thing that will result into the effect of the desire of the motion. Mr. Speaker, the, my, my majority group have not approached this matter in good faith. Because if they approach it in good faith, they would not have, in the, from, the, from the position of the, the, major, the, the, the minister for, former minister of information, say they would not be able to support it. Because they contributed in making the motion appear in the present situation. It is, Mr. Speaker, the there, there, there is there is something that Honorable Deputy Majority Leader on and has brought it to the floor today. I'm very happy, Mr. Speaker. Today, he brought it up. There was a request for a withdrawal and then you upheld it and made him to withdraw. He said it publicly in the media that we are obstructing government business by our opposition to whatever is brought on the, on, on, on the floor of parliament. Mr. Speaker, that is not called obstruction. That is called opposition. We don't obstruct government business. We speak on behalf of the people and we make sure that we don't allow the majority side or the majority group Honorable, to impose a will. Member, hold on. Yes, the, the leader. M Mr. Speaker, with respect, our rights on a point of order and on this writing i have two issues one there hasn't been a reference to order 112 yes. as it's been alluded to the reference was made to constitutional provision 108 yes. Mr. my respected colleague is also saying misquoting me that i have used certain expressions in the media with greater respect to him i have not i have said that we must not be giving such an impression don't say if you want to get it right for the records of the hands up please pick what i said and quote verbatim then i would have no problem with all due respect mr speaker then he said we are arguing in bad faith mr speaker what is his contention under bad faith what is it that we have said that Mr. Speaker was not the same issue that Honorable Ahmed raised that one is imputing improper motive. Who is arguing bad faith? What is red herring? Mr. Speaker, we are contending that same must be redrawn. He should argue and not make improper. Uh, 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 impute improper motives you know to this other side mr speaker he should withdraw honorable members i decline to recognize honorable upon Kruma because i thought he was going to raise a red herring i looked up the meaning of red herring i don't think it is offensive so i rule out red herring but the issue about Exciting. 
the issue of citing or misquoting the article cited. I'll give you the opportunity to correct yourself, Honorable, and continue. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, yes, Article 108 of the Constitution is the same article lifted in our standing orders. And it's talking about imposing tax, imposing cost on, our, on, on, on the consolidated fund by way of introducing a bill or amending a bill. Nobody has talked about a motion. It, has, it doesn't talk about a motion. That is urging the president to take steps. The speaker, that argument is done. Uh, it, it's not. It's not reflecting the motion as moved by Honorable Ayaga. And so, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Member, let's be clear. Yes. I'll quote the Constitution so that you'll be given the opportunity again. Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the president and the rest continues so the reference to a motion is appropriate the honorable member did not misquote anything thank you mr speaker mr speaker i relied on our standing orders honorable ayerga would like to I, I would like to yield to briefly to him to respond to it honorable member you have the floor please continue. okay Mr. Speaker, our standing orders, as I said, does not refer to a motion. But the Constitution may have referred to a motion. But this is not imposing tax. It is not imposing tax. It is not imposing cost. It is appealing to the President. The President still has a right to say no, because this is not a law. So, Mr. Speaker, that argument cannot be a reason for their refusing to accept this motion. This motion is good. Mr. Speaker, we are in difficult times. Mr. Speaker, COVID has caused a lot of havoc. Mr. Speaker, it has collapsed businesses as they have agreed. Mr. Speaker, it has made parents have difficulties in paying school fees and therefore calls on us to show responsibility, to demonstrate that we love our kids. Mr. Speaker, they have already made it a policy. The policy is to give free money to people. People during the campaign were receiving free monies on my mobile numbers, mobile, mobile numbers, on their mobile numbers. Mr. Speaker, through mobile money, they were transferring money to people because they said they wanted to alleviate the suffering of people. We are simply saying that extend it to the students. The students are also suffering. Mr. Speaker, if today, because of students, they are calling that obstruction. Yes, honorable. Yes. Uh, uh, right, honorable speaker, my colleague on my right has made a very serious statement that during the electioneering campaign, they were uh, transferring monies on phones. That's a wild allegation to make. Who was transferring what? Was it from the S Who was doing that? If he cannot substantiated this wild allegation should be withdrawn. This is not a forum for wild allegations. This is a very serious forum. The how would you verify the transfer of money? For what purpose? To who? Is it from the exchequer? With the greatest of respect, we shouldn't we shouldn't make this allegation part of the hands up. If you cannot substantiate who was transferring money from who to who and the source of the money Yes. We, should, we should just expand it from the record. It's too embarrassing for himself and his nation. It, it should substantiate the result. Right, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Member, it is true that the NBSSI this based its loan application for small businesses through mobile money system. So, it is a fact, it is not an, um, a wild allegation. It's official, those who applied and those who qualified were given the money. It's a loan through their mobile system. So it's a fact. With your, with, with, with your indulgence, with your indulgence. 
he was mentioning electioneering campaign. No. But if it's a national exercise and monies were to be transferred, the distinction should be clear. Nobody was using money to try to induce people to vote. That was what he was trying to impute. And right now, Speaker, the distinction is clear. If there is a national exercise and the beneficiary should receive the money via mobile transfer, that is a different kettle of fish. But to say... Thank that you, Honorable, the, yes. Honorable Member, thank you. I did not hear him say it for election. I would have ruled him out. If he said so, it is false. And if it is say, if said so, that part should be expunged from the record. Honorable Member, please conclude. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy you did... The, the, the honourable minister, the honourable former minister, uh, has been kept, has been, has been. I don't remember conclude. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy that today we are debating this motion. Today our students can go home and sleep with ease, hoping that our friends from the other side, or using all the the reasons for which they are not going to support this motion will rescind that decision and support this motion because you already have it a policy to give money to people and you demonstrated it, you can demonstrate it this time too. Our students are waiting, Mr. Speaker, I believe very hard, strongly that it is going to be a landmark victory for Parliament to have a minority, the minority group suggesting something supported by the majority group implemented by the executive. At least for once, we will say that Parliament has a bite and Parliament can move things in this country and can make things happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Kweku Kwateng, not member for Obasi. Obasi East or West? Obasi West, Mr. Speaker. Obasi West, yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, in view of the discussions that have happened in this House, and where I think this House is really going, I would like to quote extensively what Article 108 says. Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced, or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the president. A. Proceed upon a bill including an amendment to a bill that in the opinion of the person presiding makes provision for any of the following. One. The imposition of taxation or alteration of taxation otherwise than by reduction. Or two. The imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by reduction or free. The payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana of monies not charged on the consolidated fund or any increase in the amount of it issue or withdrawal or for the composition or remission of any debt due to the government of Ghana or Mr. Speaker, this is where I think we ought to be paying the attention B. Proceed upon a motion including an amendment to a motion of which in the opinion of the person presiding would be to make provision for any of the purpose specified in paragraph A of this article, including removing money from the consolidated fund or public fund. Yes. Mr. Speaker, when I look at Article 108, I am wondering why is this House debating a motion, the effect of which is unconstitutional? Why, why should... Honorable let me listen to Honorable Ayaga. Please, it must relate to what he is saying, nothing more. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
You need to be a constitutional lawyer to understand some of the provisions of the Constitution. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when you look at Article 108, 108 is talking about the settlement of Honourable financial Member, matters. Honourable Member, has he said anything that is not warranted by our rules? He has quoted the Constitution so far. Mr. Speaker. So there's nothing objectionable. Mr. Speaker. Kindly resume your seat. Kindly resume your seat. Honourable Boko Martin, please continue. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in order that you we will understand some of the financial provisions in the Constitution, you ought to understand how our financial arrangements work. Mr. Speaker, this motion is inviting this House to pass a resolution that asks government to take money from the Consolidated Fund and use it to pay for those expenditures that the school fees of the students would have paid. That is what the motion is asking us to do. There has been references, Mr. Speaker, to the COVID-19 alleviation measures. Honorable Kojo Opon Kuma has already explained that those measures and the associated expenditures came to this house and this house gave approval for expenditures in respect of those expenditure lines. Government does not have the power to make expenditures for which provision has not been made and for which approval was not given. Again, Mr. Speaker, government can choose to receive that approval. If government consider, if, if, the, if parliament considers that relief from school fees should have been part of the measures that came, we are at liberty to rescind our approval and ask government to come back including what we want. But we cannot pass uh, a resolution approving uh, measures and associated expenditures and turn around and ask the executive to do something else. But Mr. Speaker, there's another illegality associated with this motion. As we speak, the expenditures of government are governed by the expenditures in advance of appropriation this House passed last November. Outside that, government is not able to spend. If you go to the expenditure in advance of appropriation, we approved under Article 180 of the Constitution, there is no room for the fiscal impact of what this motion is seeking to do. There's no room. So if this motion were to pass, Mr. Speaker, and government should seek to do what Parliament is requesting, the only option is for government to find money may be borrowed outside the approved sources and use that to finance this unplanned expenditure. Mr. Speaker, they realize the illegality of this action. Under our laws, under our laws, Mr. Speaker, to spend outside appropriation or budget is punishable by imprisonment. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker, if you permit me, I'd like to read Section 962 of the Public Financial Management Act. A person acting in an office or employment connected with the procurement or control of government stores or the collection, management, or disbursement of amounts in respect of a public fund or a public trust who authorizes expenditures exceeding the approved appropriation in the relevant budget commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a term of imprisonment of not less than six months and not more than 12 months 
or to a fine of not more than to the value of the assessed impact of the commitment or to both. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. Even if this motion were to pass, the finance minister is unable, because of this law, to spend as the motion says. So, what shall it profit a country? What shall it profit our tertiary students? If you pretend that you really want to provide them relief, but you choose the path that is unlawful and that will not bring them that relief. The speaker, that is what we are doing. If this motion, and I say this in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, if this motion passes and it is challenged for its unconstitutionality, Mr. Speaker, let's be cautious Let's avert our mind to the fact that whatever we do is subject to the Constitution and not make a decision that somebody could challenge to embarrass this House. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Mutala, kindly tell us your full name because I only have Mutala here. Ibrahim Murtala Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to contribute to the one of the most outstanding motions moved in this house by Honorable Mahama Ayarga. And I can't but agree with Honorable Rashid Palfil that this is one of the best motions that I have witnessed as a member of this house and the seat parliament. Mr. Speaker, I strongly believe that this motion was informed by profound empathy and sympathy and love and care and concern for frustrated students who are not able to pay their fees. And as we have this deliberation, those frustrated students are watching us and are watching with the conviction and belief that at the end of the day, sympathy and empathy and concern and the we feeling for others would triumph. They are watching with the conviction that at the end of the day, this house will take a decision that would ensure that they also benefit as we have benefited, for which reason we are representing constituencies in this house. We are being told that about seven of students who have gained admissions into tertiary institutions have paid. The 30% doesn't matter whether they can pay or not because the previous year it was a little over 60 percent and therefore if we have about 70 percent or more paying this year the other one doesn't matter for god's sake we are talking about thousands of students who are not able to pay their fees even if it is a single student who is not able to pay and i tell the former deputy minister for education it matters mr speaker candor and sincerity matter not only in our deliberations in this house but in our engagement of politics in this country the former minister for information was absolutely disingenuous when he selectively misquoted his excellency or taking this his excellency president mahama statement out of context and he said the president mahama said that it was freebies he described the social intervention measures that the government took that it was previous. And that was enough. I thought he was going to tell us the justification he provided for which reason he described it as previous. And if you refuse to do that deliberately, that is a perfect candidate for this ingenious comment that is made by this August House. Because you need to tell us why he said that. Mr. Speaker, there is no denying the fact that the challenge confronting us as a result of COVID is everywhere. As a matter of fact, the IMF projected that the world economy was going to grow or grew by 4.4% and indicated that that is the worst since the recession in the 1930s. And Ghana is no exception. 
my the honorable my uh, uh, honorable Afenyo Martins in his submissions indicated that government has not been able to even meet his revenue targets and that is true if government is not able to meet his revenue target it means that productivity is a challenge it means that economic activities are challenges now who are the huge benefit or, 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 or uh, uh, who will be the, the the people who will be at disadvantage if the economy is not doing well it is not just the government but the petty trader at makola the farmer in my village the fisherman in the coast who is not able to get some of the things he would have gotten because those things are imported into this country and for which reason transportation has been the hardest hit that those things are not brought in the few that are there which is competed for cost of procuring them will also be very high and by extension it affects economic activities you don't need to be an economist to have an appreciation of the challenge that is confronting us as a result of this mr speaker i think that we need to take into consideration the effects and i have heard today that yes it is discriminatory as a matter of fact the free shs which my good friend even touted and the so the intervention that this government the previous government had in the matter of electricity and water it was also discriminatory if you didn't have pipe born water or pipe in your house you are not going to be a beneficiary of it when you do not have water you won't benefit so I think that that is missing the point. If you want to reduce it on such cliches of just this one is a populist statement, this one is a populist position that is taken. Granted that it is a populist position, the bottom line is that several thousands of students out there, those thousands of students, the former deputy minister for education described as they do not matter. Pondering the plight, the suffering of people at a distance in our comfort for me is the most dangerous thing to ever happen in the body politics of this country. If we take into consideration that several of these people are struggling, they are not being able to pay. And I think that we will all support this outstanding motion without any further debate. Mr. Speaker, it is also important to state that the amendment therein that indeed affected the previous motion and for which reason we are discussing this motion to include accredited private institution for me makes this motion one of the most outstanding motions i have ever witnessed being moved in this house that these people those students private tertiary institutions are several folds more than public tertiary institutions in this country the parents of those students also pay tax the parents of those students are also affected by the effects of this COVID. They pay the taxes for which reason you and I are all paid as members of this house. If people do not pay taxes, I don't think that we can earn our salary. And those people are simply asking, please 275 members of parliament show sympathy, show empathy, so that we can also have the opportunity to be representing this house sometime, someday. And if you think... If you think that their plight and their concerns do not matter, you, you may take a decision. You may decide that you won't support it. I guess that the people would judge. I know some of my colleagues who represent consensus that are considered as the most poor consensus in this country. I represented one in the civil parliament. And sometimes when I sit down and these discussions are taking place, I ask myself whether indeed we know some, some of the things we are discussing. Those people cannot even afford to pay for private residence. As someone who was not an MP, I had to manage to organize free extra classes for students who don't have the luxury to pay for classes. And because they couldn't finish their syllabuses in the school, they had to catch up with their colleagues. I had to manage to pay for free extra classes for those students so that they can catch up with their colleagues who have the privilege opportunity perhaps to have free extra classes or to have extra classes paid by their parents who may be members of parliament or ministers of state or businessmen who can afford i think that we should take into consideration the plight of these people in having this discussion now the question is also being asked where is government going to get the money if you read the business and financial times the former minister for finance the caretaker minister for finance indicated palpably that there is some money in the COVID elevation funds and shockingly what 
he should be telling us how much he has, but he said there is, and that, and that, they are going to use that money to set up a development bank. Set up a development bank at a time when students are struggling to gain admissions to pay so that they can go to school, so that the human resource base of this country can be built. The third taker finance minister is saying that we are going to use that money to set up a development bank. Mr. Speaker, and I challenge myself and I challenge my colleagues, let's challenge our consciences. Let's challenge our consciences that we are talking about the future of several people. We are talking about the plight of people whose parents do not have the luxury to pay for fees. Let's take that into consideration. And I urge you all that regardless the discussions that we have had, regardless the contentious positions we have taken, let's take a decision based on the determination and the zeal to show love for our fellow Ghanaians, more so the poor people who, but for free education and for such assistance, will not have the opportunity to be here. With this few words, I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I strongly, and I strongly support this outstanding motion. And I know that some of our colleagues, most of them, if not all of them, will agree with me that yes, we may have a position, but let's show sympathy and love. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Honorable, now we are to the leaders, right? And we'll start from the minority leader. Now we have exhausted our Yes, Honorable Gatiamon, you are not on the list of contributors, but may I know why you're on your feet, please. We heard, uh, yeah, sure. See, I, I inquired and I was told that uh, I, I, I possibly could uh, chip in a word. More so because the point that I intend to make has to do with the constitution. I, I was told that I could bring it to your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So may I you. proceed and bring uh, to your attention the constitutional uh, point that I... Unfortunately, unfortunately, the leaders of the house gave me a list from either side and I'm Ma the Majority way. Leader, would you want to plead with the speaker so I bring the constitutional matter to his attention? Napo! Napo! I'm bringing some matter to this, uh, the leader's attention. Speaker just indicated that he wants clarification from you whether I can bring the constitutional matter to his attention. Honorable Katie, that is not what I said. I said I was giving a list of contributors and uh, one of the most senior members of the house, you are not on the list, regrettably. But you can share your, you can share your, your fact with the majority leader. Yes, honourable majority leader. Mr. Speaker, the other day when we met on this, I think the suggestion was to have five on either side before the leaders concluded. Uh, but subsequently when we met, we scaled the number down to four, inclusive of the, uh, the leaders. The last meeting, I wasn't there, so I'm not too sure of the numbers. If now, after the, um, the honorable member who spoke from the other side, the minority that is granted space would have been shortchanged by one. So in that context, before the minority leader speaks, Perhaps we would accord space to um, the, the former minister for education. And then the minority that can come in, and then I would, I would wind up. Um, from the list I, that was passed on to me by Mr. Speaker, four persons each minus the leaders. So including the leaders will be five persons each. Honorable Samukurujito, Haji Aladi, Rashid Pelpo three, Mutala four, minority leader five. Kojo Pongkroma, Dr. Adichu, Koku Kwating, Afenyo Markins, four. Then 
majority leader, five. So that is how it is now. All right. Yes, so one of them are actually there. Mr. Speaker, let me thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the motion ably moved by the Honorable Mahama Ayanga that this Honorable House resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps, to take urgent steps, emphasis my to absorb the fees of students of public tertiary education institutions for the 2020-2021 academic year and to extend support to accredited private universities as part of the national COVID-19 elevation measures being implemented by the government of Ghana. And Mr. Speaker, in doing so, to commend him and to state that Mr. Speaker, in arriving at this motion, there was consultations guided by the speaker that will improve upon this motion so that this house will speak with one voice in calling on the executive and the president to do what is needful for parents and students who have struggled to pay fees or who are struggling to pay fees, or who are unable to pay fees. Mr. Speaker, in doing so, first of all, let me respond to the Honorable Kojo Opon Nkrumah when he sought to give an indication that this side of the House was not supportive of government effort in matters relating to the management of COVID. And Mr. Speaker, I refer you to the hazard of Friday, 17th April 2020, on the approval of the Rapid Credit Facility Agreement between Government of Ghana and IMF to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. Speaker, in particular, to refer you to column 221 of uh, column 194. And Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I quote, at that time, I had opportunity to lead this group I still have the privilege to do same. Mr. Speaker, I said, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the motion for the adoption of the report for the equivalent of 738 million SDR, which is about 1 billion for Ghana to mitigate the financial and economic impact of COVID-19. And the IMF is reported to be providing disbursement to many or several African countries. Mr. Speaker, and I said, I speak in support of the adoption of the report on behalf of this group. So why create this erroneous and misleading impression? Not just this. I've also heard the Honorable Kojo Opon Nkrumah sought to argue, referencing Public Financial Management Act. Mr. Speaker, we are in Ghana. We are in this house. When we pass the Custom Amendment Act, on over eight vehicles and uh, 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 those salvage vehicles, the government of President Nana Dudankwa suspended the operation of the law. Where did you do that? Where did you have authority to do that? Because you are responding to traders in Swami and Abosokai, you could suspend that. But you cannot today accept what Honorable Ayaga is calling upon you to do to support students who are in distress and parents who are in distress, let anybody argue that parents and students have not suffered any distress as a result of COVID. Mr. Speaker, interesting times. The Honorable Kojo Opon Nkrumah has just succeeded in shortlisting President Nana Dudankwa as President in breach of the laws of Ghana and President in breach of Article 17 of the Constitution. When he talks about discrimination, the free senior high school program, the flagship of President Nana Adudankwa, has it been extended to Ghanaians in private schools? If no, I want to thank Kujo Nkrumah for reminding us that President Nana Adudankwa is in breach of Article 17 of the Constitution and is a candidate for not respecting the laws. Who talks about discrimination? 
free senior high school today is limited to Ghanaian public schools, rightly so, because of the distinction and dichotomy between public and private. So to say so, Honorable Minister for Information, you are not being helpful to the President, but will hold him and you accountable to the law. Mr. Speaker, I've also heard reference to Public Financial Management Act. Interesting times. I want to ask, when the Minister of Finance came to Parliament, under the civil Parliament, for financial sector cleanup of the banks, with lead to expenditure of 23 billion, where is the fiscal impact analysis which was presented to Parliament? When the same government came and said, I'm suspending payment of water and electricity bills, where is the fiscal impact analysis that was presented to Parliament? When he said, there will be support for small-scale businesses. Where is the fiscal impact analysis? So from today, no minister should walk to this house if he is not accompanied by fiscal impact analysis, if he intends to introduce any bill to this house. Mr. Speaker, even tax-free for frontline health workers, commendable initiatives of the President, we are not in normal times. Where is the fiscal impact analysis? But we supported you because we live in extraordinary times. And the president deserves our support. We supported the setting up of the COVID trust fund. We supported the emergency uh, powers out of the president because we knew that this public health emergency has disastrous consequences. So, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Kodi Opon Kuruma, come again. Your argument on discrimination will work flatly as unsubstantiated. Mr. Speaker, I am and I know that you are a student of constitutional law. May I now respectively refer you to what again he sought to rely on when he quoted Article 108 of the 1992 Constitution. And with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I quote, for the purpose of the record, has had to capture the full rendition. It reads, Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced, unless the bill is introduced, we are not discussing a bill. The Honorable Mahama Yerga is only urging government to take urgent steps. The steps can take any form that the president may so desire. President Nanadu Danko may choose to say that I would absolve as a minister, uh, minister designate for education name. Dr. Edujum said, if IPS students 70% have paid, why are we not interested in finding out why the 30% have not paid? If probably it is that they don't have money, the president in taking and responding to Honorable Ayerga could simply say, I absorb the fees of that other 30%. We can do so with an analysis of fees paid for University of Ghana, University of Cape Coast, the University of Kwame Nkrumah, University of Science and Technology. Of all the public universities, we need to do a neat test to examine the circumstance. So, Mr. Speaker, what the Honorable Ayarga, let me quote 108 well so that I don't leave you hanging, Mr. Speaker. Or the motion introduced by or on behalf of the President. Mr. Speaker, A, emphasis, proceed upon a bill, including an amendment to a bill that in the opinion of the person presiding, referring to you, Mr. Speaker, makes provision for any of the following. Imposition of taxation. The Honorable Ayarga is not seeking to impose taxes. I heard the Honorable Caretaker Deputy Minister has finance, Honorable Quarting, say that when you offend Public Financial Management Act, then he read imprisonment provisions. Let us help you. The budget for 2021 have not been passed. This is Parliament. If we so resolve, in consonance with the motion ably moved by Honorable Ayarga, we will make appropriate budgetary allocations to absorb that. Don't be talking about the past. Talk about today and talk about the future. This does not and will not lead to any illegality. Not at all. If we so decide, Mr. Speaker, they are talking about revenue. 
The chairman for the Ghana Revenue Authority is reported to have said, reported in the graphic Monday, Commissioner General, the government has exceeded its revenue by 2.5 billion. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what is the Honorable Ayaga seeking to do? Is one, does the Parliament of Ghana appreciate that parents and students are struggling to pay fees as a result of COVID? My answer is yes, because businesses have suffered. Imagine that your mother or father was working in a hotel which has not functioned in the last 11 months. How is that parent going to assist you if you are already in school or you are to begin school with the payment of the fees? Now, speak, I'll run you through. I won't be able to do it for all the universities, but just for University of Ghana, my understanding, freshman science, 2,106. Agriculture, 2,169. Applied sciences, 2,231. Veterinary, 2,231. Then it goes to make a distinction with those who are undergraduate fee paying. So, Mr. Speaker, those who preach discrimination. Honorable Kojo Upon Nkrumah, go back to Article 17 and make sure that from today, President Nana Abidankwa extends free senior high school to every private senior high school in Ghana if it's not to be held to be in breach of the law. So, Mr. Speaker, what the Honorable Ayerga Benchmark revenue was determined by Parliament. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is reported in Tema to have suspended it and said that 50% of it should be paid. Was that illegal? Was it in breach of the law? The law affecting survey vehicles, Swami and Abuso Okai, the law was passed by Parliament. An announcement was made prior to the election to suspend it. Was it illegal? Was it in breach of the law? So, Mr. Speaker, we are not asking to condone. Now, what my colleagues' opposition should do is for us to ask ourselves how much can President Nana Dudankwa and this government contain? To what category of students must he necessarily be seen helping? How many of them have been able to pay and how many are not able to pay because of COVID? But Mr. Speaker, the truth is that, and Honorable Okon, I remind you again, when you go to the Hansa, even the day we moved the motion for the one billion, I had in my contribution said that Ghana will need more than five billion US dollars to get out of COVID. We know that this economy is in distress and may not have the capacity to accommodate the kind of burden. That is why you need a fiscal impact analysis. But for water and electricity, where is the fiscal impact analysis which was conducted? And is it, again, could you oppose the theory of discrimination? Is it every Ghanaian who has benefited from free water and free electricity? So to those who have not benefited, the Honorable Opon preaches discrimination, that you've been discriminated again and you are reminded. So Mr. Speaker, let me conclude by commending the mover of the motion and to say that this motion to borrow the words of Honorable Mutala is just for Parliament to show the Honorable empathy. Speaker will take the seat again. Yes, uh, Honorable Member for Tamar Saf, have you concluded? Mr. Speaker, I was just in my concluding paragraph, and if you may indulge me one additional minute, I should bring closure to what I, um, I was speaking on. So, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Mahama Yarga is inviting this House 
to appreciate the circumstance of parents and students who, as a result of COVID and this public health pandemic, are not able to support their awards adequately to pay their fees. The Honorable Ayerga is saying that the president takes urgent steps. How can taking steps be unconstitutional? We know the president. In taking the steps, he'll be guided by the constitution and he'll be guided by law. And he'll be guided by what he brings to this house. So this forum, and Mr. Speaker, I worry. When I heard deputy uh, leader, Honorable Afenyo, Mr. Speaker, you recall, I don't discuss backroom conversations in the open. I don't. My mother didn't train me that way. So I'll leave it there. But when we discussed this motion and this amendment, I personally requested Ahmed to walk to leader and to him to look at the motion again and to persuade the Honorable Ayaraga that, look, carry the country along. Carry our colleagues along. Let's improve the motion. So when you come here and it's as if there was no discussion on consultation, you are injuring my faith to consult further. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be, given the nature of this house. So the Honorable Ayarga is saying that Parliament resolves the decision is for the President to take those steps appropriate. That is all we are seeking to do. But fact remains that, Mr. Speaker, many parents are not able to pay. Many parents have had to borrow to pay. Many students are still not able to report to school. And that COVID have affected packets. Nothing more. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I suppose that is the turn of the Honourable Member for Swami, Honourable Oseche Mensa Bonsu. Honourable Member for Swami. Mr. Speaker, with respect, are you referring to the Majority Leader? I, I'm sure you are not listening to me. If you were, when I referred to the Honorable Haruna Idrisu, I only mentioned his constituency. I did not mention the position, but that, if you want me to continue to insist <laughs> that you are majority leader, and that will make you happy to contribute well. Mr. <laughs> Speaker, with respect to you, you know that officers in this house are recognized by their office. You know that. Like the right honorable speaker. Like my colleague, the minority leader. And ministers are recognized by their titles. Mr. Speaker, I will not proceed further. But Mr. Speaker, in in rising to contribute to the motion before us, first of all, I want to express my delight in the fact that procedurally we got it right by having the Honorable Member, the Honorable Ayariga, to indeed remove the motion because in essence the form and character and indeed effect of the motion before us now as he himself alluded to is materially different from the motion that he first moved which got seconded by our um, colleague honorable peter kwesi nochu kutu mr speaker the Earlier one we said was cloudy because he had used certain words like suspense uh, that the, the House re requests the President to, to take urgent steps to suspend the payment 
or fees. And we're not too sure what he meant by suspension. He was talking about the fact that the um, parents are undergoing hardships. The speaker, if the effect of the motion was merely to suspend, that is temporarily relieve them, they certainly would have had to pay some time later. And so it would not amount to any mitigation if it was merely to suspend and then come back later to pay. Mr. Speaker, so it was one of the reasons why we argued that the motion was incompetent. Mr. Speaker, um, secondly, the member did not tell us when the suspended payments were to be made, perhaps a year later or two years or whatever, or perhaps for as long as the gravity of COVID-19 lasts. The speaker again, he related at the time to admission fees, and we suggested strongly to him that the term admission fees in the catalog of fees and charges is just one aspect of, as you yourself said, about 30 fees and charges that the universities um, imposed on the students. So he could not then come under that cloak to describe the rest of them as admission fees. In any event, it's only freshers who pay admission fees and not continuing students. These were some of the reasons why we suggested strongly to him that the motion as it stood at the time was incompetent. But the speaker has ruled that that motion um, was competent. And speaker, you came with a ruling which you read to us last Tuesday. The issue is, if indeed, as the uh, speaker, you uh, insisted that the motion was competent, why would the member make a U-turn to have a new motion in form, character, and effect introduced in the House? Mr. Uh, Speaker, on, on, and to respond on, on, to on, what on, issue... On, on, just a minute. That was not the impression I got. I thought we went beyond that to direct that we should have consensus on this matter. And that you should come back with a consensual motion. And I thought that was what happened. It's not that the member has taken a U-turn because the last sitting of the House, the member still insisted on moving the motion as it were. And I directed that go and consult your colleagues on the other side so that you can come with a consensual motion. That was what happened. Please, I'm sure you will take that on board. That is on board already, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, my colleague, the minority leader, it was who first suggested this term that he should rather amend the use of the term suspend and in his place substitute absorb. He declined. And Mr. Speaker, indeed, you yourself reiterated the point. He still declined. Honorable Majority Leader, I, I see one of your able lieutenants on, on his feet. Yes, Honorable K.T. Hammond. Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Indeed, I'm happy that eventually you took um, the chair because I was itching to bring a, a very serious constitutional matter to the attention of the House. Mr. Speaker, because Honourable you, member, you are completely out of order, <laughs> which is the majority leader is contributing. If he has not breached any standing orders, he, 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 ha he, has, order. he has breached a constitutional order, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, he is wrapping up on this whole debate, which to me, Mr. Speaker, uh, is an unconstitutional honor, exercise by the Honourable member, yes, you Mr. are Mr. completely Speaker. out of order. I see. I thought it was important to let May Mr. you Speaker resume go. your seat. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Yes, Mr. Resume Speaker. your seat. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, honorable, you may continue. Mr. Speaker, the constructs of the motion before us today reads that this House resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps to absorb the fees. Mr. Speaker, these two words in line two are significant. To absorb the fees. Absorbing fees payment, Mr. Speaker, comes with financial implications. The speaker, the second word that has been used in line two is fees. What fees are we talking about? The speaker, he himself gave us a basket full of fees that the tertiary institutions require students to pay. And what we met the other day, the speaker, as part of the consensus that we're building, he was to allude to the specific fees that he wanted us to deal with. Today, he has not mentioned any such. So what are we dealing with? Again, Mr. Speaker, it's so cloudy. The unclarity that we sought to establish is still hanging in the air. He has not done justice to this motion by referring to any specific fees. Mr. Speaker, we cannot join ranks with with him in such a wild goose chase. Mr. Speaker, the, 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 the move of the motion is not doing justice to us. It's only leaving us hanging. And to the extent that the appeal is just to um, the generality of our citizens, that we should show concern. Concern we must show, but we should be clear in our minds what we want. He has not demonstrated to us what he wants. And that is why my, my colleague said that he is engaging in uh, a populist misadventure. Mr. Speaker, then he says that we, the, um, the, in, to continue, that this House resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps to absorb the fees of students and public tertiary education institutions for the 2020-2021 academic year and extend support to accredited private investors as part of the national COVID-19 alleviation measures being implemented by the government of Ghana. In line four, he's referring to the extension of support. What is the nature of support? Again, we are left in doubt. What is the nature of support that he wants this house to join ranks with him on to to alleviate the, the hardship on parents and indeed on the private institutions. Again, we are left in a quandary. So, Mr. Speaker, that unclarity which we said had afflicted the first motion still follows the second motion. And for that reason, I suggest strongly to him that, again, this motion is incompetent and cannot be supported. Mr. Speaker, the other issue that he related to... Hon Honorable Member, I ruled that the first motion was competent. Now you are saying, again, this motion is incompetent. Are you by then challenging my earlier ruling? Mr. Speaker, with respect, the ruling related to the first motion, you have not given any indication that this motion is competent or not incompetent. I believe that this motion is incompetent. And that's my I have, argument. I have, I have no problem with you talking about this motion. But please, it's English language. If we say again, this motion, you premised it on earlier statements, uh -huh. which meant that the first one was incompetent and this one is also incompetent. That is why I've come in to draw your attention. Mr. Speaker, with respect, the first motion is no longer before us. That first motion is not before us. It's this second motion that is before us. So I'm just saying that 
just as we argued that that one was incompetent. But we have ruled for in respect of the first one that it is competent. Even though I may you disagree with your ruling. You are talking about uh, this motion, so go on. Yes. Yeah. Even though I may disagree with your earlier ruling, just because I have to live with it and I respect it. It's a useful guidance for us. It is good for you to disagree, but live with it. <laughs> yes. Just because, as I told you the other time, I disagree with you, but I will live with it. Because it's a ruling from the chair, and that should be a guide to all of us. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that really uh, should concern us, and the, my colleague, the Honorable Ayariga, uh, related to the approval that we gave in this house to support small, medium enterprises and the approval that we gave to support pharmaceutical businesses. Mr. Speaker, those are in, um, they are not in public space. They are private enterprises. So I agree that this extension to private um, um, institutions could be, could be uh, good and could be situated in the ambit of the COVID-19 uh, alleviation program. But what fees should be paid by parents or guardians? Because it's said that some fees should be paid by the parents and guardians, and perhaps even the students themselves. What fees? He doesn't tell us. He only says that some, he, even with this, parents shall have to pay some fees. Guardians shall have to pay some fees. And students shall have to pay some fees. What fees is he talking about? That must be borne by the parents, guardians, or the students. Mr. Speaker, he cannot leave that to any imagination. And that is why I say to him that this motion is incompetent. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of discrimination, um, some, some interpretation has been given to the issue of discrimination. Um, people saying on, that... On, on our, just, just a minute. I see the... Is that deputy with? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, in talking about the motion being a consensus-based motion, the Honorable Minority Leader in speaking said he sent me to the Honorable Leader. And Mr. Speaker, saying that the motion is incompetent because we don't know which fee. Mr. Speaker, I do remember as leadership meeting, it was agreed that we should come and debate the motion if it is carried. The Honorable Leader suggested that we then form a committee to know which of the items. And I was sent to call the Honorable Ayariga by then. So, Mr. Speaker, if we discuss this and we build consensus, and you brought a suggestion, I thought he was going to you include the suggestion as part of his submission here. That Mr. Speaker, as leadership we discussed, I agreed on the test. And I was sent by the test by the Honorable Aaron Ebrisu to him. And he agreed that, oh, by this form, I have no problem. I'm okay with this. Provided Ayariga will be okay. I then came to him. He said he was okay with it. Mr. Speaker, we must help you as leaders to mind the house. But if we agree on something, only to come round and disagree. Mr. Speaker, we may not be, be we may not be fair to this house. And Mr. Speaker, I think it's a very terrible path that the Honorable MP for Swami and leader of government business is charting. And it is not healthy for the affairs of this house. He, what he said was that if the motion is carried, what figures are we talking of? We then form a committee just to go through the items and point, pinpoint which of them that we can recommend to the executive that, oh, this one can be absorbed. It was based on that that we pleaded with Honorable Ayariga to eliminate the word suspension and make do with the word absorption. So, Mr. Speaker, what is he saying? That the motion, this one too, is incompetent because we don't know which item, which item. We know, we and you agree that there will be a committee to do certain recommendations and send them to the executive. Uh, uh, so based uh, on that, the motion, Mr. Speaker, is, co is competent and you have admitted uh, uh, it. I don't remember you, you are re-debating re the motion. I think now we are concluding. So 
Please allow the majority leader to conclude. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Ahmed, I know, is an elder in the Church of Pentecost. And I know and I want to believe that he will not lie. The speaker, he came to me and my first reaction was, what is the disposition of Honorable Mahama Yariga to this? Because Mr. Speaker, the Honorable, the Honorable Minority Leader was the first to suggest the word absorption. And he declined. Mr. Speaker, you yourself, the second day, insisted that he use the word absorption. He declined. So when he came to show the test to me, I asked, what is his own attitude to this? Does it mean that I have conquered? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor. Honorable, honorable member. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is not good. It is not good to do this. Honorable, it is not good to do this. Mr. Speaker, now, the point that is being made is that um, this House has given approval to the first quarter expenditure for this year. That is the votes on account. This comes as, as a motion to absorb the cost and of course, the cost would impact on approved expenditure. The speaker, expenditure, as you do know, is based on revenue and income. If government has to absorb payments, what expenditures in the approved program must be cut? The speaker, I raise this matter. I raise this matter. And that is why I said, I suggested that in that case, we may even have to go into this. Mr. Speaker, Parliament has already approved the expenditures for the nation for the first quarter. As I said, if we have to tinker with it, the appropriation would mean that the House will have to move a motion of recession in respect of line allocations to enable the absorption to take place. Have we done that? Nothing of that nature has been done. So how do we proceed on this? Mr. Speaker, if, or, the point has been made about Section 100 of the Public Financial Management Act, and my colleague, the minority leader, is saying that then, from hence, no bill or program should come to this house if it is not accompanied by uh, a fiscal impact analysis. Charity should begin from home. We have been urging the executive to do this. So the point that was made is that has any attempt been made to cost the effect of, the, of this motion? Mr. Speaker, now students in the public universities make up about 58% of students' populace. And those in technical universities make up, I think, about 12% of students' uh, populace. Then, for the private universities, we have about 30% of students in such place. Mr. Speaker, we are told, because we are not distinguishing between postgraduates and um, students pursuing uh, first degrees, if we should average the payment of user fees around 3,000 and the total number of students as we have them now is about 500,000. Mr. Speaker, what is being suggested is that government should absorb the payment of about 1.5 billion Ghana cities for the 2020-2021 academic year. Mr. Speaker, the 2.5 percent for VAT, the get fund, translates to 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion for 2019-2020 academic year. For 
2021, it is envisaged that it will go up to 1.4 billion. It's the reason why the vote on account had expressed in that 350 million figure to quote the exact figure, it was 350 million 605,719 Ghana cities. That's for the first quarter. It was in anticipation of it going up to 1.5 billion. The speaker, if the 2.5 is giving us 1.3 billion for the year, how then are we to make do with the payment of the 1.5 billion? Are we in a position to increase VAT by another 2.5% to use that much to pay? Is that a case being advocated? Or is it that government should cut some expenditures? And if government should cut some expenditures, we should lead government on that these are frivolous expenditures. Can we look at these places? No such suggestion has come from the move of the motion or any of the contributors. Jessica, it is the reason why some of us are saying that the motion as it stands is incompetent. Mr. Speaker, the, it's important to uh, correct an erroneous impression. The Honorable Kodro Pon Kroma never said that the other side of the House did not agree to the passage or the approval of the um, COVID-19 alleviation um, funds. Mr. Speaker, if I heard him correctly, he alluded to a statement, a statement made by the former president, President John Dramani Mahama. I'm not too sure I heard him say that the other side did not support. Mr. Speaker, he is here. He can speak for himself. He can speak for himself. That is what indeed I heard. Mr. Speaker, the minority that related to the f former finance minister coming to this house to plead with us or to request the suspension of the ceiling of the fiscal stability uh, law. Mr. Speaker, contained in that law is the provision that in emergency situations it could be, the ceiling could be suspended. The minister availed himself of that opportunity. That's exactly what he did. It was within the remit of the law. The speaker, what we are doing today, and this motion, the amended motion, reads that this house resolves to request the President of the Republic of Ghana to take urgent steps to absorb the fees of students of public tertiary education institutions for 20 2020-2021 academic year and to extend support to accredited private universities as part of the national COVID-19 alleviation measures being implemented by the government of Ghana. The speaker, this really is going to impact on the public funds or the consolidated fund in particular, which is why the honorable member for Obuasi Obuasi West, the Honorable Koku Kwating, drew our attention to Article 108. My colleague, the minority leader, in averting himself to it, related just to bills. But it does not relate only to bills. It relates as well to motions. And it reads, for the avoidance of doubt, Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced, or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the president proceed upon a bill including an amendment to a bill that in the person in the opinion of the person presiding makes provisions for any of the following speaker a roman number one says the imposition of taxation or the alteration of taxation otherwise than by reduction what we are doing on the face of it is not because our colleague did not relate to raising VAT by 2.5% to accommodate this. The speaker has nothing to do with the imposition of taxation, at least for now. 
Now, two says the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or the public funds of Ghana or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by, re by reduction. What is the effort of this bill? The speaker, this one is saying that the, we are going to have to impose a charge on the consolidated fund. That indeed is what is happening. Mr. Speaker, then C says the payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana of any monies not charged on the consolidated fund or any increase in the amount of that payment issue or withdrawal. The speaker, four is not relevant. But you come to B, B then says, that is one way B, says, Parliament shall not, unless the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the President, proceed upon a motion, including an amendment to a motion, the effect of which, in the opinion of the person presiding, would be to make provision for any of the purposes specified in paragraph A of this article. And paragraph A, among other things, the speaker relates to the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund. The speaker, it relates to the payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund. The government is going to have to absorb the payment of fees. And the speaker, truth is, if these fees are not paid, some of the investors, the tertiary institutions, would collapse. They will not be able to run. And the speaker, for that reason, he is suggesting that we cause the payment from the consolidated fund to these institutions. What does it mean? Mr. Speaker, that indeed, that indeed affirms Article 108, as simple as that. So, Mr. Speaker, the point being made that we should not embarrass ourselves walking on this path for any, any citizen of this country because on the face of this, this is crystal clear that the import of what we are doing is to cause some money to be taken from the consolidated fund, unbudgeted for as it is now, to effect payment. And Mr. Speaker, clearly, that would be unconstitutional. That is unconstitutional, and Parliament should not. Hey, Honorable Majority Leader, it is not proper to try to go through the back door to call into question my decision to admit the motion. I considered Article 108 in its entirety, and I considered the motion, and I of the clear opinion that this motion doesn't offend any provision of the Constitution, including Article 108. That is why I admitted it. If I had thought otherwise, I wouldn't have admitted the motion. And so, please, be guided and don't go to that extent of trying to repeat what Honorable Katie Hammond wanted to do. You may continue. Please become guided. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are all human. The Speaker is human. And I believe the Speaker, with respect, is not assuming any pontifical credentials. The Speaker is Catholic. He's an avowed Catholic. Mr. Speaker, so I'm just I'm just thinking aloud that this, in my opinion, this, in my opinion, offends the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, and so I believe that even if a vote is taken on it, regardless of the consequences of the vote, I would think that this would ridicule and embarrass this House on the face of Article 108 uh, and Mr. Speaker... Honorable Majority Leader, there is nothing preventing the President 
from taking this request on board in budgeting in the next budget to cover this. There's nothing preventing the that is why listen. What 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 you are doing is accepting that this is a motion on a very critical matter of national concern. You all agree to it. It's not a critical matter of national concern. Again, that is why the honorable member initially came for suspension, to suspend, request the president to suspend. Now, the issue was raised as to whether that will be a relief and even your submission you refer to it and so i thought you build the consensus on to absorb now i'm clear there was no consensus in this matter the way the debate has gone so let's take on board first the guidance i gave second the ruling i made and third, if the House is not minded to support the motion, the consequences thereafter. And I believe that this is a motion that will be in the national interest and the President himself would love to take action. Because I'm not participating in the debate, no. I am simply guiding the House. So please, it is not in the interest of this House or your interest to be behaving the way you are doing. Be clear that it is not in the interest of the nation and it's not in the interest of this House and it's not even in your own interest to go the way you are going. I am not referring to the majority leader. I'm talking to those who are uh, trading some noise at the back. And I, I, I have an eagle eye. And I can name people. And the consequences are grief. So, Majority Leader, please kindly wind up and let's see whether we can take the decision today or in view of the circumstances, you will guide the Speaker to take a different process. Mr. Speaker, I've heard you and uh, the, I think the, the principle, the principle is accepted by all. The principle in alleviating hardships is accepted by all. Is the content of the motion that we are debating. Let's look at every member of parliament, every member of parliament is hugely aware of hardships in the constituency, in their own backyards. And we go in various ways to support our constituents. The principle is understood. Is the content of the motion before us that we are debating. And Mr. Speaker, what you just suggested, what you just suggested, that can it be taken maybe in the course of time um, in the next budget? That is a further amendment to the motion. That is a further amendment to the motion. Mr. Speaker, so it is what we are talking about, the content and the construct we are suggesting strongly to the move of the motion that it is inappropriate and speaker with that i will end on the leg that parliament should be careful on the content of this motion uh, speaker because um, it will be very difficult to ne negotiate and navigate 
if the matter the this matter should be tested about the constitutionality of what you are doing but the principle we all do appreciate the speaker with that i would beg to end my contribution i thank you very much for the space granted Yes, the Honourable Member for Goku Central, Honourable Mama Yaga, wants to exercise his right of reply under Order 864C. Please, Honourable Member, you may go. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, First one to my right to reply, permit me to respond briefly to a number of issues raised by friends opposite. The Minister for, the former Deputy Minister for Education, and now the nominee to the Minister of Education, indicated that he has done some cross-checking and for a place like Accra Technical University, about 70% uh, of the students, UPSA, 70% of the students are reported to have paid. Mr. Speaker, I have a, an admission letter from the College of Humanities, Bachelor of Arts, University of Ghana. Paragraph 5 of the letter says that you are expected to confirm your acceptance of this offer and secure your place to the University of Ghana by paying a non-refundable commitment fee of 30% of the fees stated within two weeks from the date of issuance of this letter. Many, if not all of the investors have pegged 30% and some have said 50% of the fees as non-refundable commitment. So it is perfectly possible that they have gone to collect loans and pay the 30% to secure the admission for now was the struggle and hope that their government or their country yes, will yes, intervene yes, to yes, support them. Uh, Honourable yes. Member for Efutu. Yes. Mr. Speaker, with respect, you gave my colleague an opportunity to speak under a specific rule of this House. What he is doing is not a reply but he is re-arguing the very matter because mr speaker the terms of his motion was backed by a lengthy argument submission in support some of the very issues that he's re-arguing have been responded to by colleagues who have the right to speak so mr speaker i am humbly inviting you to hold that he should restrict himself to the terms of that motion. No, no, no. The terms of the rights given to him to reply. If he goes outside the then, Mr. Speaker, it means that we are going to reset the argument in motion. With all due respect, Mr. Speaker, I shall submit. Well, I have a challenge here. Uh, and that challenge is as a result of practice. It was my colleague, the first deputy speaker, who was presiding. And I took over at a time that many of you had made your contributions. And so it will be difficult for me to determine whether what he's doing is replying 
or re-arguing. And I said this challenge is as a result of our practice. In other words, I should have allowed the first deputy speaker to conclude the whole process because of such uh, challenges. And so um, the, the point of order is uh, well taken, uh, but uh, because of the situation, I will allow him to go on, but you should take the point you raise on board. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, precisely because I know that the mover of a motion has a right to reply, pursuant to Order 86, throughout the arguments and presentations of my friends on the other side of the aisle, I did not attempt to even interject and respond to the arguments, hoping that when enjoying my right to reply, I can take the issues one after the other. This was a specific argument made by the minister nominee for education, in which... He is not saying you don't have the right to reply. He said you should limit it to reply, not introduce new matters. Mr. Speaker, my understanding of reply is that somebody has made an argument and you are replying to that argument. That is my simple understanding of reply. And so he raised the issue that the motion itself is belated. In effect, that was his argument. It is belated because the students have already paid their fees. And he, as former deputy minister, has made calls to vice chancellors. And that one, the vice chancellor said that the issue of fees is not their priority at all. He said that in this house. That the issue of fees is not their priority and that we can check from vice chancellors and that he made a call to the university to find out whether the students have already paid and that the report that he has is that in most cases 70 percent of the students have paid mr speaker this is fundamental to the motion he said that the motion is no longer necessary and i need to reply let, to let, that let, one. Me, let me listen to the one who raised the point of order M mr speaker when we want to go on the path of the rules, we should limit ourselves. This is what are the 86 say. 86 5. And he underscored that. A member... Please. A member who has spoken to a question may again be heard for the purpose of explaining some material part of his speech which has been misunderstood or vindicating his character or conduct if it has been impugned, but you must not introduce new matter. You interlock this with the 4C, and I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, you have clearly led him on the right path, but you try and rebut an argument by Honorable Educhum will not be doing so within the terms of this order. Because you are right now, because, Mr. Speaker... Honorable Member, you got it wrong. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'll, I'll be guided be by guided, your... Be yes. guided according Mr. Speaker, you quoted 86. No, what, what you quoted deals with all members of parliament. Any member, after you've contributed to a question, and then you feel that somebody has misunderstood or misrepresented what you said, you have the right under 86.5 to come back, any member. Now, we are dealing with the mover of the motion, which is the 86-4C. And that is why he's limiting himself to that. He's not taking advantage of what rights ordinary members of the House uh, have. So please, just allow him to reply. I will, I will make sure that I guide him according to the rules so that he doesn't reintroduce new matters. I will, if he's not going to stay within the parameters of the rules, I will call him out of order. Please. So, Mr. Speaker, many of the students may have found 30% and paid, but they still owe the universities 70% of the fees.
So a motion by this House urging the President to take steps to absorb the fees will still be helpful to those students. And even if 70% of the students have paid, I called NCTE and got the statistics on tertiary education student population for 2019. 2019 was about, 2019, 2020 was about 547,000 students for tertiary education. So if even 70% of that number has paid, what you have outstanding will be 150,000 students who will still not have paid. Honorable member, you are going beyond. What you even your motion is dealing with 2020, 2021. Now you are referring to 2019, 2020 data. Yes, that might only serve as a guide. Yes. So let's let's talk about 2020, 2021. Yes. So my argument is that if you use the numbers to project, as we speak, because they all haven't finished paying, you cannot get the statistics of student population. But if you use last year's population conservatively, you can estimate that... He is not using last year. He is using this year. Let me listen to him. No, but you cannot rehash. You are replying. You are replying to exactly what he said. Yes. yes. So, please, may I, may I listen to him? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm being misrepresented here. What I said was that two years ago, without COVID, 67% of the students who were admitted duly registered and attended the school. The year after, last year, without COVID, 63% duly registered and attended. Now, this year, with COVID, 70% duly registered and attended. So the point I was making was that where is the crisis? And, and that was what I was saying. So I was not. Honorable member, you, you, if you say duly registered and attended, it has nothing to do with payment of fees. Because fees, 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 fees are paid from different sources, including scholarships. And so you have to desegregate to know, you see, is what we just said is so pregnant that you have to go beyond that. And what we're dealing with those who really pay the fees. And we we're talking about the parents, the guardians, the students, and the impact also of non-payment on the institutions. So this global statement is not helpful. Mr. Speaker, I want him to say it exactly how I presented. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that anyway, the argument I made. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, please allow the honorable member to reply. Mr. Speaker, you have already ruled on the constitutional matter. But just to add that the, the leader of the majority group who raised the issue on constitutional matter must be mindful of the fact that Article 108 deals with the settlement of financial matters in this House during debates on bills that relate to financial matters and the movement of motions relating to financial matters. This motion is simply urging the President urging the president to take steps, to take steps. Initially, I proposed that he should take steps to suspend some of the fees, the fees. And the issue was raised in this house that if he suspends the fees, somehow the schools will still run and then they will run on some budget. And therefore, instead of saying suspend fees, we should amend it to read absorb the fees. And so we amended it to read absorb the fees. The question is, what do I want? I've been asked severally by the leader of the majority group 
what do I want? So, Speaker, I want us to compassionately urge the President to take urgent steps to absorb the fees of the students so that the students can have some relief and some support. So, Speaker, I believe that uh, the motion has been extensively argued and debated. Uh, the records will show. And my deputy, our deputy whip on the minority side has indicated the extensive consultations that took place to lead me, Mr. Speaker, also urged by your very good self, to amend the motion in such a way that we can build consensus. But then I see our friends on the other side again resorting to technicalities and etc. as a backdoor strategy to oppose assistance to needy students who cannot pay fees to attend tertiary education in this country in the light of our COVID-stricken economy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, honorable Member, this motion has nothing to do with needy students. So please, it's talking about all tertiary students, not needy students. That is so. Yes. So it includes so, needy and then non-needy students. So all students, Mr. Speaker. All students, Mr. Speaker. But the point that I'm making is that there is a clear attempt to use the back door to oppose a request that students be assisted in the light of the impact of COVID on household incomes in the country. Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much for admitting the motion. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to argue in support of this motion. And I urge colleagues to take a cue from what the Speaker said the implications of voting against this motion and its impact on all of us. And also that when we say take steps, it could include making arrangements so that in the next budget, because we're talking about 2020-2021 academic year. It's a whole year. And so the steps that the president is being requested to take, definitely can include coming back to this house to ask us to provide support and we could, in this house again, approve a budgetary allocation to support the students. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, honorable members, before I go to the issue of putting the question. Oh yes, honorable, is that honorable Kennedy of Japan? Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker. I have a fundamental problem with the motion. I, I personally believe that the word suspension on, 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 is even better than absorption. Honourable member, honourable member, uh, yeah, I, have, I, have about the challenge, I have a challenge here because I've been guided by leadership in this matter. Yeah, but they submitted. Yes, a minute. Resume your seat, Mr. Speaker. Resume your seat. Mr. Speaker, resume your seat. I just want to be guided because I was given a list and from the majority group it was made up of five members and the indication I got was that the majority leader was to sum up and add his own at the end of your submissions. Is it the case that you want us to open up for more members to contribute? If that is the case, I will allow you and then take one from the other side. After the mover has replied, I can always open up the debate. Yes, Majority Leader, yes. The Speaker, I was just indicating to my colleague that by the terms of 
any debate once we do the winding up the the door is shut and the speaker then will have to put a question so i just urge my colleague that you should stay within the confines of the conventions and practices in the house so Mr. Speaker, we are in your hands. Um, if you want to put a question, you could put a question. Well, I, I wanted further guidance uh, because um, I recall that the House gave directive as to how this House should operate. We say we have now started the virtual parliament and that some members, a percentage, if I recall correctly, talked about one third should be present here while the others remain in their offices. And so um, by the constitution and the standing orders of the house, would it be proper for me to put the question here? When by our own directive, by our own directive, some members are in their offices. Because I got information from some members they were in their offices. But let me clarify one issue. The, the positions of majority leader and minority leader are defined in our uh, in the standing orders but when you go to order 86 3 as to how we should refer to each other is very clear 86 3 says ministers shall be referred to by their ministerial titles the deputy speakers and the deputy ministers shall be referred to by the names of the offices held by them. All other members shall be referred to as honorable, together with the name of their constituencies. That is, the honorable member for the added Swami, where an honorable member has already been so described in the speech, he may be further referred to as my honorable friend, or the honorable gentleman, lady, or member, unquote. And so, if we are to go by the terms of the, the standing order, I will be referring to you as the honorable member for Swami, or as some other orders refer to, leader of the parliamentary party or parliamentary group. This is the reference made by other standing orders. Now, by usage, by usage, even when I was minority leader, that was the reference I was being given. Minority leader, majority leader. And so a reference to any of you by your constituency is a correct reference. There's nothing wrong with it. But the majority leader has a right to ask me to add majority leader. And so I want that clarified. Honorable members, the leaders will have to guide me in the circumstances COVID-19 and the directive we gave Will it be right for us to put the question now? Or we should use the other processes, the processes of division or whatever is decided. But by the standing orders, either we take the voice vote or head count, it's only when it's challenged we can move to division. But we are directed earlier on that we don't want this place to be crowded. And so we permitted some of us to be in their offices. Will it be proper to take the vote here, voice vote, whilst they are in their offices? 
That is what I, I want your assistance. They will shout from the offices. Yes, minority leader. Mr. Speaker, a very significant guidance. We are all in respecting your directives and guidance on COVID and to work further to avoid a spread have accepted that minimum numbers will be available to do business. And therefore, with that understanding, it's not all members on both sides who ought to be here. But Mr. Speaker, we have no difficulty. And I want to assure you that this side, this side, will respect even a voice vote on this matter but let the record have it that on a matter that we consulted on a matter that we sought to build consensus on a matter that uh, uh, honorable, best... honorable minority leader <laughs> we have finished with that i just want guidance on the how to put the question yes majority leader speaker I believe that we have um, finished with the debate on this motion. The next move is to put a question. But you are introducing some new elements that some people at your instructions may not be here with us. For which reason, uh, you may want to maybe delay the putting of the question. Let's be we are entirely in your hands. I wouldn't have anything useful to add to it, except that it will have necessary implications going forward. But we are in your hands. Whatever step I take will have necessary implications. Because I gave the directive after leadership of the House discussed the matter, and I was authorized by leadership as the Speaker to give that directive. It did not come from me. And so, will it be fair for me not to hear the voices of those who are not present? That was the issue I raised. And so, if we say I should go on, whatever way, it has implications, was I will be presiding. And I can always put the question at any time, if it is left to me. But I want to be fair to all sides or both sides. That is why. I'm consulting you. If you say I'll put the question, I'll put the question. You are always in my hands, and I'll know when to put questions. Honorable members, at the end. Speaker. Oh. Yes, Speaker. Um, you are indicating once again that you want to be fair to everybody because of your initial statement in the house which is why i said that in that case i have nothing useful to add so mr speaker it is the reason why again i emphasize that we are in your hands that is depending on the instructions that you gave i'm not insistent if it is that it has to be uh, maybe uh, put the question may have to be put subsequently i have nothing against it if it is that real um, further consultations broken by you should be done this is because i have nothing against it but i want i want us to be truthful to ourselves no nobody should make any statement here to imply that some people have broken faith it's most untrue it's most untrue and that is why i insisted people should report accurately People should report accurately. Uh, honorable Member, Mr. Speaker, Speaker but that's as I said, further to, to that, further to that, everything is in your hands. I have a discretion, and I'm guided by the provisions of the Constitution and our standing orders, to be fair and candid. And that is why, first, usually, I want to consult the leadership. And when I'm talking to the House, or addressing the House, it's not just to the leadership, is to all the members, and also for clarification and education of the public listening to us. 
so that at the end of the day they are clear in their minds that nothing untoward has been done. I believe strongly that this is a very critical matter and we need to get the views of those that could possibly attend to be part of this decision. And that is why I stated, I took the earlier position I just articulated. Um, I would have preferred that we even go to division where each member will write whether for or against because politicians must be held accountable for their decisions. And that is entirely not in my hands because the process is clear in the standing orders. It's what is in my hands is to put the question and then to take the decision head count. But as I said, we by our own act, which is a directive, took away some heads, which cannot be counted here. You see, as to division, that will be upon your uh, uh, questioning my voice vote or voice vote decision or the head count. And so I'll, I want to defer the question and then Tomorrow, we tomorrow is a sitting day. You know, this is an urgent matter. Is tomorrow acceptable to members? Now, I put the question. At the conclusion of the debate, the question is, as many as in favor of the motion say aye. As many as are against the motion, say no. no. I think the news have it. The news have it. Honorable members, the motion is accordingly negated. Yes, honorable members, I intend to adjourn unless there is something more to be considered. Yes, Majority Leader. The speaker, I think there is... Um supposed to be a joint caucus to consider issues pertinent to the review of the standing orders. But uh, when the time after 6 o'clock getting to 7 p.m., 
I believe we can we can take that one tomorrow. I thank you. So you can you can adjourn. Our honourable members, order, order, order. Honorable members, I will proceed to adjourn the House. And the House is accordingly adjourned till Friday, 29th January 2021, at 10 o'clock in the forenoon. The House is adjourned.